This program features live coverage of an African safari and may include animal kills and carcasses. Viewer discretion is advised. Good afternoon everyone. We are looking at some very interesting looking creatures called the blue wildebeest and this is Safari Live. Welcome everyone and a very special welcome to the Three Chopped Elementary joining us for the first 45 minutes of our drive today. My name is Ali and on camera with me today is Senza and we are coming live to you all the way from the Greater Kruger National Park in South Africa. Now we were looking at some wildebeest as you saw earlier on which are also known as GNU but I think we can also start calling them ghosts because they have pretty much disappeared, vanished into the bush. We cannot see not even one of them anymore. Look at that. <laughs> They have all gone away. I think they have actually crossed this little dip over here looking for something else to eat on the other side but that just gives you an idea of how hard it is to sometimes find some of the animals around here. If you have any questions about the, um, the animals that we're looking or not looking but possibly looking to find please feel free to send them through uh, via your teacher. Now I am still a bit puzzled as to where all of these animals have gone but I think maybe our best bet is to actually try and go around and see if maybe they come onto the other road because the direction where they were heading there's another road cutting across so I think we're gonna try and reverse suck the vehicle around and then go see if maybe we can see them again because um, yeah they have turned into ghosts and we can't really see them anymore who would have thought one of the biggest antelope that we get here in South Africa pretty much vanished eaten by all the bushes hmm all right, let's see if I can reverse here. Luckily our cars are quite small, so it shouldn't be that hard to try and get onto the other side. No big trees behind me that I can crash into. Definitely don't want to do that. Just on the start of the drive. And off we go. Ooh, I see another animal all the way from here. And it's perhaps one of my favorite ones because it's very pretty. Ah, look at that. Exactly where the wildebeest were, now we have one of the most famous ones of all of Africa, the zebras. Very beautiful and as you can see they have all these beautiful black and white straps but I'll tell you something, the zebras that we get in this particular area, there are many different species, but the ones over here, you can tell they're the zebras from South Africa because of that faint line, I'm sure you can see it in its bottom. That it's there's the black one, the white one, and there there's one that's almost grey. So that is the very much um, outstanding feature of the zebras we get around here. So just for a bit of a close up of a zebra's bottom, and now we have two eating. So you see very beautiful creatures, and often we will find the gnus and the zebras together, or hanging out roughly in the same area because they don't eat on the same things. They both eat grass but one of them likes the grass is a little bit longer and the other one likes the grass and it's a little bit shorter so it's almost like going to the cafeteria and everybody else eats something different so they don't really have to fight for what they eat. Although they are following the same direction that the wildebeest were earlier on so perhaps <laughs> they're also going to become ghost zebras as they carry on moving. You see, look at that, it is amazing how as soon as they start moving behind some trees and it's like perhaps the deer or some of the other animals that you might have around home, as soon as they start moving and going behind the trees, it's very hard to see them. So you can see how all the stripes, even when they stand out so nicely out in the open, as soon as they go behind the bushes, it's almost like they disappear. Look at that. I'm sure, imagine if we were driving past here really quickly, we wouldn't be able to see them. You would just be like, oh, you know, it's just a bush down there. And now, thank you, zebra on the left, for posing so beautifully for us. So we get a very nice contrast between the one that's hiding and the one that is not hiding. We can still see you clearly with all those beautiful stripes of yours. Very, very similar to a horse, you may say. 
but this ones have just got a bit more of a mood so they're not perhaps as friendly as some of the horses and they're very well known for kicking and biting so probably not the best pet to have around <laughs> although I'm sure many people have tried they are however one of my favorite ones around because they're so pretty look at those stripes now one of the most interesting things about the zebra is that you see for us all of the stripes look pretty much the same and you think like oh you know they've all got vertical stripes but actually if you start paying attention and hopefully we will see more than one zebra together again all of their stripes are different there are no two zebras that look the same so it's very easy to if you just look at the spot to distinguish one zebra from the other and you'll be able to tell well oh this is zebra number one and this is zebra number two Beautiful. Very beautiful zebras. They are feeding peacefully all the way around here. But I think just because they are heading into an area that is a bit difficult to follow because we can't really follow them amongst the bushes. We are going to carry on on our afternoon bumble and see what else we can we can try and find. Hopefully many more things because the weather should be good enough. And I'm going to send you across to my friend Jamie, all the way in the Maasai Mara in Kenya. And welcome to the Sunset Safari. My name is Jamie and this afternoon Dave is on camera with me. And a special warm welcome to the school kids joining us this afternoon. I hope you are all very, very excited. Uh, my friend Ali is all the way in South Africa. And Dave and myself are driving around an amazing place called the Maasai Mara in Kenya. So you're actually getting to go on safari in two different parts of Africa. We're halfway across the continent on the eastern side of Africa in here in Kenya. And as Ali's told you, I'm looking for cats. In fact, I'm looking for lions. But my biggest problem right now is that the lions are not where we left them this morning, which is terribly inconvenient. So, where do you think a lion might be hiding? It's been very, very hot today. It's looking like it's cooling down and it looks like there might be some rain later. But where do you think a lion might have hidden itself? I think it's gone to hi they've gone to hide somewhere in the shade. And the lions that I'm looking for have got a very silly name. They're known as the Sausage Tree Pride. And I don't know where they've gone. I'm hoping that they've gone somewhere easy to find. Maybe they're just really embarrassed about their name and they've gone to hide away. I think I'm gonna go down that road. So while I go and search under every tree to see if I can find some lions for you, let's go back to South Africa so that Ali can give you some more fascinating information. Thank you. I hope you all enjoyed meeting my friend Jamie. We are also going to try and find lions this afternoon. Now, another one of our guides this morning was very lucky to see a big male lion. So I am hoping we'll be able to see it too and show it to you guys. But it is still a little bit far away from where we are. So we're going to drive along and see what else we can find on the way there. So fingers crossed in the next, I would say 20 minutes or so, we might be able to have a look at the lion because the thing about the lions is that they are very big beautiful creatures but on days like today when it's nice and cool and overcast they tend to move quite a little bit around so they're not always going to stay in the same spot where we left them but it is the best way to go onto the last place where we saw them sleeping and the best way to go and check around but while we do that look at this the wildebeest that had disappeared we've bumped into them again Where are you going? So, question from the elementary school. You're wondering if the zebras use their stripes to hide away from predators like the lions. Yes, yes they do. It's one of the main reasons why they have lions, although there is a whole very big debate amongst all of the people that study zebra as to why, why do the zebras have stripes? Because it's such a beautiful, striking animal that just stands out wherever you see it. But some of the consensus is like that they have the stripes so that they can hide from all of the potential predators because as you guys saw as soon as it goes behind the bushes all those stripes actually make it pretty much disappear and the other thing that many people say or that is apparently the new thing that everyone believes is that the actual 
actually the stripes prevent certain types of flies from landing on the zebras because funny enough the flies don't like the stripes so how's that <laughs> they've got their own natural insect repellent or fly repellent right tattooed right on their skin which is fairly cool i would say so they have pretty much carried with them they don't have to worry about going to the shop and getting insect repellent or anything like it but yes the stripes also have a very interesting visual effect. For example, I don't know if you guys noticed or remember when the zebras were feeding close to each other, the one was here and the other one was here. And it's almost very hard to tell which one, where one starts and where the other one ends because they blend in together. So it is believed also that it helps to distract the predators because then the predator doesn't know really how far away one particular zebra is or if it's actually the one behind it or the one in front of it. So it just confuses them a little bit. So they've got all sorts of tricks up their sleeve to be able to survive out here in the African wild. A lot of the animals that we get in this particular area do, just because they have to <laughs> develop a few tricks against how smart and clever some of the predators are. As, as you can imagine, to try and survive and escape from a lion, you've got to be very smart, but also you need the help of certain um, features on your skin. All right, I'm seeing something but I think it's just a tree, tree stump in the distance oh no it's a warthog let's see if we can show you what the warthog looks like and the warthog is if you've seen the Lion King it's Pumbaa now Pumbaa is hiding there to the left Ooh. all right there we go We're running away Ooh. two three four hello little ones <laughs> So that was a mom and it's three young ones running away, three little piglets. And they've carried on running. I can't see them anymore. Let's just keep an eye out for one second, see if maybe they are around. Nope, I think they've carried on running. Oh, there they are, well spotted. Very, very well spotted. Now, if you guys have any questions about the real life Pumba or the warthog, as we normally call them down here, please feel free and maybe I should learn how to talk first <laughs> feel free to send them through you can ask your teacher to send us your questions and we'll be more than happy to answer them look at those three little ones running with their tails up and it is funny because their tails are normally down but when they start running then that's when the tails go up almost like a flag you are hiding very well so you see, in this case, for example, the little warthogs, they don't have any stripes like the zebras do, but because they are all gray and similar to the colors of their environment, then it's very hard to actually spot them. So you see, they've also gone behind the tree, so everybody hides behind the trees over here or amongst the thorny bushes, and pretty much you become invisible and it's very hard to see you. Which is pretty much what they've done, very clever of them, although we wouldn't hunt them or eat them, <laughs> so they're safe from us. Now let's carry on. Seems like this has been a lucky road so far. Some zebras around here, some wildebeest, some warthogs. Chapter elementary, you guys are wondering how many different species of animals do we see in one day? Well, ooh, many different ones. It's very hard to tell sometimes. We can go for hours and maybe see two, three different species of antelope and that's about it. Or maybe just a few different species of bird. Although on days like today where it's very nice and cold, I would suppose that a lot of the animals are just gonna be hiding in the bushes where it's nice and warm. So where there, there's a lot more trees just to keep warm and away from the wind. So I don't know, we've actually never done a particular count of total species of animals that we see on one drive. So that might be something interesting to try out one day. But I would say anything from maybe 5 to 20 different species, including birds and mammals and reptiles later on. And then as we go and start doing our bushwalks, what is that we, instead of taking a car and going on safari with the car, then we do it on foot. And then we focus a lot more on the little things and the insects. And now that we've had some of the rain starting, very likely all those creepy crawlies are going to start coming out, which is fantastic news for us. Because then we can start walking and finding a few more things than what we've been used to. So if we count all the insects in, I don't know, maybe if we're very optimistic, maybe one day we can get to a hundred different species. It would be very, very nice because often also you start seeing them and you can't, oh, there's impala here, there's wildebeest, and because you see them a few times and you stop actually counting, you get distracted, <laughs> which is probably not the best thing to do. Now, let's see what else there is around here. 
I said, I think we're gonna have to go maybe slightly quicker if we want to get to the ma male lion. I am hoping that he's still gonna be there. So fingers crossed he is, but I'm hoping to see also anything else on the way. Perhaps even a few spotted animals like the leopards. That would be very nice. Because the leopards are a lot smaller than the lions, but they're also very elegant, very beautiful creatures. Now, let's see. Seems like it's been quite a quiet day. So in South Africa, we are heading into our rainy season. So yesterday, actually, we got so much rain. So, so much rain. Chopped Elementary, you're wondering if we get any scorpions in South Africa. Yes, we do get a couple different species. We get some that are very, very venomous. Very, when they sting, they can actually cause a lot of damage. And then we get some others that are not that bad. But we do get them in this area and we use, especially during the night, you can use those UV lights, those white lights. And if you go particularly to the trunks of the trees or the holes in the trees and they shine, it's very funny because of the substances that they have on their skin. So we get a few different species around here, but those are some of the species that we're hoping that we're going to get around here. Now we've got, what, oh, come, Rusty, reverse. <laughs> Sorry, the car doesn't want to reverse. We've got two beautiful birds of prey all the way there. Let's have a closer look. Now we had a very long debate about a very similar looking bird yesterday, but my money is again on Wahlberg's eagles. <laughs> but uh, yes, so we get all different species of birds in this area and some of the ones that we get like this one they actually migrate so they don't spend the whole year here they go all the way to northern africa europe and then they come back all the way down in south africa to have their chicks and then go all the way back and normally when they come back we know that the rains are starting because there's going to be a lot of food a lot of insects little things flying around all the way for them now I want to try and get them, show them to you in the book because unfortunately the weather is not the prettiest today and it's perhaps not helping us all that much. Now this particular one that we are looking at, now all I can think about is a booted eagle. <laughs> this particular one that we are looking at, it's called the World Bird's Eagle and like I said normally found in pairs so there's two of them that are always together and once they've established their nest and where they want to have their nest then they come or they're reported to come every year back to their nest every year back to their house that's pretty cool isn't it now this is the one that I think that we are looking at it's called the Wahlberg's Eagle very beautiful and this is actually one of them seems to be quite pale in color quite white so they are normally of this color over here on the top this one over here so you see it's actually quite of a brownish color but they can morph into different colors and some of them are actually white so this is a very nice find because this is a very unusual bird to see so yay brownie points for us for some finding something rare but they seem pretty relaxed all the way there so we're gonna carry on and try to make our way all the way to where we want to go which is still <laughs> far away but it's the beautiful thing about the bush we carry on bumbling now, seems like Jamie has managed to find the biggest animal out in the bush, so let's go and have a look. Unusual bird indeed, but what is not unusual to see out here in the Maasai Mara are elephants that are absolutely everywhere. And that for me is a very special thing because of all of the creatures out here, I love spending time with elephants the most. And although I can't spend too long with them today because we've got other things to do, it's nice every now and again to just stop and enjoy their company. Obviously the biggest animal out here and also one that lives for a very, very long time. So this lady here with her big tusks hiding behind the bush, I would say that she could easily be over 35 years old, even around about 40 years old. So an elephant can live right up to 60, even 70. And there's her little one. I would say that that's probably her baby, three or so years old, and a lot of growing to do before it catches up to mum. I'm trying to pretend I'm not hearing the thunder. It's not going to rain on us tonight. So the ki for the kids watching, our plan tonight, if we're so lucky, we get to stay out the whole night with the different animals that are out here. Isn't that incredible? We get to sit and follow the lions. 
Uh, that's a beautiful question from a Chopped Elementary. Back onto our elephants before we get talking about lions. Now, Chopped Elementary, and the kids watching, you want to know why do elephants have such big ears? Well, here's the thing about elephants. Obviously, they're very, very big. And because they're very, very big animals, they will get very, very hot in the sun. Especially because they're dark colored and they're outside all day in the baking hot sun and it gets very hot here. So the reason that they have those big ears is it's kind of like a built-in air conditioning unit. You know how your body sweats when you get too hot? You get all sweaty and then the sweat of evaporates off your skin and it helps to cool you down and this is the way that elephants cool themselves down so in those ears are blood vessels lots and lots of blood vessels if you look at the if you look at your hand and you see all of the sort of the blue veins and the capillaries running through so an elephant has a network of blood vessels in there and the blood flows through and the skin is quite thin and then when they flap their ears like that, it makes the wind pass over the blood vessels and it cools the blood down. And then the blood goes to the rest of their bodies. So that's the way that elephants cool themselves down. I don't know how many of you perhaps have dogs at home. Do you have dogs at home? You've seen them when it gets really hot, they start to pant. And that's the similar idea. It's basically bringing air into their, into their mouths and helping to cool the blood down. And that goes to the rest of the body. Even the babies have big, big ears. So when an elephant flaps its ears, it doesn't mean that it's angry. It just is trying to cool down. Oh, my goodness. The kids are they're really thinking hard about these animals because Chopped Elementary has seen all of the mud that's coating the elephants, and they're wondering why do elephants use mud like that. And the reason is, you spot on it, is like a type of sunscreen, but it's for something else as well. So elephants really like to bathe themselves in mud and that mud helps to keep them cool because it stays wet and then similar to, to what we were talking about about when you're sweaty. The air blows over the wet mud and it helps to cool them down. Plus, as you said, it acts as a sunscreen so it protects their skin from the harsh, harsh rays of the sun. So I wouldn't suggest that you try it. Maybe, maybe don't cover yourselves in mud. Sunscreen will work just as well. But obviously the elephants can't run down to the shop and buy sunscreen. So the mud helps to protect them. And then there's another reason they do it. So there are lots of small bugs and parasites out here. And things called ticks. And they like to sit on the elephant's skin. Well, the elephants don't have a finger and a thumb to pull the ticks off all the other types of parasites so by coating themselves in mud it dries and it helps to get rid of them and to be quite honest I think Ellie's just like to play in mud it's time for me to move on from my Ellie's and go off in search of some lions and it sounds like that is Ellie's, Ellie's plan as well Well, we are trying to get to that last spot where that mail was. So hopefully we're not too far away now. I think it's just one more road and then we turn to the left. So hopefully it'll be something somewhere there. And then we have to try and get to where it was last thing, which I'm sure it's going to be interesting because we're going to have to go off road and we're going to have to go into the bush where there are a lot of trees and branches and stumps and everything else to try and get there. But I am not afraid. <laughs> we shall get there at least to start looking for it, which would be very nice. Now it is quite a cold afternoon, so uh, my guess is that most of the animals are actually hiding away because they're all very, very cold. Just like us, I am wearing about three different jerseys, so <laughs> it's very cold today. And it feels maybe like it's going to start raining a little bit later on, but that is actually wonderful news for us because in South Africa we have six months roughly every year where it doesn't rain and we're just starting to come out of that period where it doesn't rain starting to get into the period uh, that we call summer which is actually the rainy season so hopefully we'll get some rain because everything around us and I'm sure you guys can notice as we start driving around you see all the grass all of this is very very dry very yellow in color so when we have a nice amount of rain uh, then everything turns green and it's beautiful and so many different colors of green and tunes and hues of, of green it's very pretty and of course a lot of flowers and all the trees have leaves because now everything's looking pretty much half dead I should say because there are no flowers or leaves or anything on it but 
I am hoping that's going to change in the next little while and as we were saying later on we're gonna be able to start seeing also a lot of creepy crawlies like the scorpions and the dung beetles <gasps> they are one of my favorite ones out in the summertime and the dung beetles if you're wondering are those tiny little beetles that roll balls of dung and that is the gift to their bride and then that's where that's what they eat and that is where they lay their eggs so that's actually the house for their young ones <laughs> sorry Lou I believe there was a question but I couldn't hear you properly can you just say it again do we have orangutans here I believe is the question um, no we tarantulas <laughs> Sorry, that was my bad. I don't know why I heard orangutans. I think maybe I'm going a little bit crazy. Tarantulas, no, we don't have tarantulas, but we have a very similar species of spider that looks very much like a tarantula, but is not a tarantula. It's, I would say, the African version of a tarantula. It's called the baboon spider, and it's also called an old world spider, just because it's, from an evolutionary perspective, it seems like these spiders are a lot older than all of the other ones, and they don't spin beautiful webs like some of the other spiders that we get around in this area do, but actually they, they have their houses underneath the ground. So that would be another one to start looking forward to. And then of course, as it starts getting hotter during the summer days when it doesn't rain, lots and lots of snakes come around here. One of the girls that we work with that is in the final control room and speaks to my ear, Megan, she has gone a little bit crazy and now she sees snakes everywhere. So she's terrifying us all, <laughs> just saying that there are snakes pretty much everywhere. <laughs> because I think she's a little bit scared, but we still haven't seen too many. <laughs> Sorry, Megs. <laughs> but no. Snakes shouldn't be feared normally in, on days like today because they are reptiles and they rely on the sun just to warm up and start moving around. On days like today, we wouldn't really be able to see them or they wouldn't actually move around all that much. Now I'm trying to pay attention to the road because there's supposed to be an obvious way for me to try and get in and start heading onto where this lion was last left, but as directions go, always driving around these roads, things are never, you know, it would be a lot easier if we had signs and be like, okay, male lion, follow this road. But I suppose that's what also makes it fun is that we don't have them, so it's always the thrill of, oh, are we going the right way? Are we looking at it? It's almost like a treasure hunt where you have to follow all the clues and then if you get lucky and if the animal hasn't moved, then there'll be the pot of rainbow, or in this case, the male lion at the end of the, <laughs> of the road. I think it is a bit, a little bit uh, further away, if I'm not mistaken. Mrs. Violet, you're wondering if the lions have ever gotten too close to the safari guides. Um, sometimes they do. Actually, a few nights ago, we had a whole pride that came and right past our vehicle, just here on the side, and then they carried on moving. So. The wonderful thing about the area that we work in is that because animals are not hunted, because they are so used to, from tiny little cubs, they're used to seeing the cars coming very close to them all the time, they just ignore us basically. So they just see us as a giant moving rug that makes a little bit of noise and smells funny and then brrr, comes around, blah, 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 brrr, goes away and carries on. So they, sometimes they do get a little bit close, but most times it's just because we are sort of in their way or the area where they want to go and they'll go around us and then they carry on moving. So some of them are quite inquisitive. Oh, I believe that this is my road. Let's go in here and start seeing where it is. All right, I do think that it's quite a long road all the way there, but we are getting closer to the last position of this lion. Hopefully it hasn't moved because on days like today, although lions tend to sleep about 16, 18 hours every day, on days like today, sometimes they move a little bit more. So let's hope that he was very tired this morning because I believe he went to sleep very late in the morning and hopefully he'll still be there. But we're gonna keep our eyes open just in case, just in case there's something around here or he's moved or gone somewhere else. Interesting. Ooh, 
Now, the one male lion that we're going to see or we're trying to find again this afternoon to show to you guys, he is actually part of a group of four lions. So it's four big males together with their beautiful manes and they are together with a few different prides of females. Now the females don't get along with one another and they all stay in their separate territories but the males they go and visit them every now and again and they're not always together the boys and in this case I think it's just the one that got away because if I am not mistaken some of the reports that we got from some of the reserves nearby was that the lions actually fought with some other unknown lions that we get into this area because you see our reserve in the area where we are it's actually it's got no fences with the national park with Kruger National Park so every now and again you get uh, stranger strange as in animals that are not generally born in this area that come along and then just cause a bit of chaos start moving around but that's what makes it so interesting because it's a proper um, natural environment and we get to see everything that happens and it's almost like watching a soap opera sometimes because you obviously because we see them all the time you get to or well maybe not all the time but it's almost like a like a soap opera Alexandra your name's just like mine you want to know why do male lions have manes well there are a couple of theories about it one of the theories is that they have manes because when male lions fight and they hurt each other and imagine those big claws you know just grabbing you here and there the mane protects their face their ears their throat their nose everything from any potential blow from an opponent but also oh, i fell in a hole but also it's believed that they have manes so that they can differentiate each other from a distance so if a female sees a lion all the way far away she will know it's a male instead of a female this way sorry Senzo was just directing me because he was here today this side okay let's see hopefully it'll be some oh, I see the two track now all right I'm gonna pay a little bit of attention now to the road to try and get, I think it would have maybe been easier to go in that side, but that's fine because good old Rusty will get us there if it doesn't fall too badly in this hole. Alright, let's see. Now I assume we're getting closer to what it was because there's a dip that I can see ahead of us. So if he is still around here, we should be able to find him soon enough, I hope. Ah, uh, there's the head. <laughs> Hello, big boy. Now, how are we going to play this around? Which way, Senzo? Should we go straight and then, yeah. Okay, sorry guys, I'm just talking to Zenza to try and find out how we're going to park. That's going to make it easier for everyone to have a look at this beautiful male lion that's right next to us. I think it's probably the way. Hopefully this won't give us a flat tire. Is that good or do I need to go a little bit backwards for you? A little bit back? Okay, sorry guys, we're going to have a look in just a few moments. Just want to make sure that we get the best possible view for the camera because obviously we all really want to see this male lion. There he is, uh, almost. <laughs> Hello boy. How amazing is that? Now this is a real king of the jungle as they say, although we are not in the jungle. <laughs> Very beautiful. And you see we are actually quite close going back to Mrs. Violet's question from earlier on. We are pretty close to the lion but you see he's carried on doing whatever it is that he was doing before we got here. And that is exactly what we want all animals to do when we come and view them. We want them to carry on and pretty much ignore us as much as possible because we are just observers. We just want to see what they do, find out what they get up to, learn everything we can about them without ever bothering them. I think somebody's going through a bit of grooming and maybe an injury on his paw over there. Seems like he was in a fight actually. Doesn't seem like anything too bad. But it seems like somebody bit him on one of his back legs. 
now he's being a very thorough boy and just cleaning himself so if you've got cats at home i'm sure you've seen your cat do exactly this what he's doing so he's just getting rid of all the little pieces of dirt grass pretty much anything that can go onto his onto his fur get onto his coat because they are very clean animals so they always like to be very nice and hygiene, hygienic <laughs> even when they um after they've eaten a lot and you can see all their faces are bloody and full of all sorts of disgusting things then when they're done eating they go they take a bath and they take much much care of making sure that they are squeaky clean so beautiful i think one of my other friends from the maasai mara is also out and about and he has also managed to find one of my favorite birds out in the Maasai Mara. So we are going to stick around with this boy while he <laughs> has a bath and make sure that he's sparkling clean. But while we stay with him, let's go over to Brent and see a very interesting looking turkey, almost. <laughs> well, from one of the biggest feline predators in Africa to one of the biggest avian predators in Africa, we have ground hornbills and it's caught a little turtle and they've got such a powerful beak they're able to crack the turtle's shell and uh, eat the yummy turtle if you're, if you're a hornbill and uh, a big welcome to the Maasai Mara my name is Brent Leo Smith I have Craig who's also known as Batman on camera and remember this is live with these big birds eating that turtle actually hear it crushing up the skull so the turtle the turtle is dead already the hornbills managed to open up the turtle but it's still using its beak as a pick to break open more of the shell to get better pieces Poor little turtle. Didn't manage to get to the water fast enough because it was probably moving from a puddle to another puddle, but it unluckily came across the very big ground hornbill. So very few things are able to crack open the turtles and tortoises shell and this is one of the few. The other is hyenas and uh, sometimes lions. But they generally prefer a bigger meal. Whether it's for this hornbill, this is a, a really nice big meal. See how sharp their beaks are. Well, this is not something you get to see every day. It's going to take quite a while for this hornbill to open up that turtle. Now, all you guys there at school, you're being a bit quiet. I want to hear questions from you and also from our viewers. Hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. Um, if you have any questions about what is happening with this glorious big ground hornbill crushing up uh, the poor little turtle. Now, it's not a tortoise, I can tell, uh, from the shape of the shell. Uh, tortoise would have a much higher shell, a, a sort of different shape. So this is one of the little aquatic turtles or terrapins that live in all the mud wallows and rivers and puddles in Africa. Now, 
I'm going to leave this beautiful bird to finish his dinner because I'm going way down south to see if I can find a leopard or a cheetah. And while I do that, let's head back to Ali, all the way in South Africa, with the big, brutish Birmingham boys. Well, we have managed to find a new spot, but I apologize, because I need to get a hold of somebody on the radio that wants to come and also see the big male lion. Ralph, sorry, um, I was busy on the radio. You are more than welcome to make your way. There's only myself here. Um, like Chris was saying, best access is via Haryuna Road, and then you'll see the branch on the road. A from come Hyena Road. Copy. All right. Sorry, guys. We when we go out on drives for security reasons, and also just because we help each other out, we have a radio with us, so. When we find something that's very big or very interesting to watch, then we have to call it in on the radio because there might be somebody else that also wants to come. So I was doing my duty and just making sure that everybody else knew um, that we are here with this lion. Although luckily for us, not too many people want to come around because it seems like there are more lions in other places. So it means that yay for us, we get to spend a little bit more time with him. Now still busy grooming itself. Virginia, you're wondering why do lions bait themselves with their tongues? Well, they don't really like the water uh, and also here the water in Africa is very dangerous. There are hippos, there are crocodiles, all sorts of things that might want to hurt a lion. So like the domestic cats that also don't like taking a bath, they have learned that the best way to get clean is just use their tongue. And their tongue, if you have a pet at home, their tongue is very, very rough. So it's not nice and smooth like ours, but it's actually got tiny little... Um, what can I call them? Tiny little particles that almost act like a cum. So whenever he's licking his skin, he's getting all the dirt out and all the extra hair and so on. And of course, because all of his saliva is there, then all of the, the water or the watery side of his saliva then makes everything dislodge a little bit easier and get out of his skin. So you see he's doing a very good job at it. And you see there's the wound that he's got. You see that hole there? So judging by the shape of the of the wound, I'm pretty sure that what happened there was that another lion bit him because it looks like a canine, one of those very big teeth that went straight in, probably got bitten in the back. But it's not bad. Lions often get all sorts of injuries and you see he is now busy cleaning itself, making sure that nothing strange, no maggots, nothing goes in there just to make sure that it heals a lot quicker. But like I was saying, reports are that apparently this lion fought with another one. Chopped elementary, you guys are wondering how long do lions live for? Well, it depends if you're a boy or a girl. So the male lions, the boy lions like this one with very big manes, because they are have to fight and protect their territories and their females and their cubs from any other uh, lions that might be in the area, they tend to live a little bit less at some than the females. So a male lion, a boy lion can live for about 10 to 12 years, whereas a female that lives in a family with all the other aunts and sisters and etc, they can live for maybe about 15 years. So it changes obviously from one area to the other, but roughly that I would say that's a good average for them. Definitely making sure that there's nothing funny in that wound. You see, living down here on the ground and sleeping on the soil gets all sorts of little things in all those wounds, so he's got to be very careful to make it very clean. <laughs> Almost looks like a big cat, doesn't he? With all that pretty... all that pretty mane and all that black hair that he's got there. But I'm sure it's not as soft as it would, <laughs> as it appears. I'm sure it's full of knots. Now, if you look at his face, you can tell. Look at all those scars on his nose. So they have a very tough life. They've got. Uh, they constantly fight with one another. And even when they manage to hunt something and they're all eating something big, like a buffalo or perhaps a big antelope, 
uh, they all fight and they all growl at each other and they all hurt because even when they eat, even if it's the same family, they all try to, to get more food. So imagine if you're like at a big Thanksgiving dinner and everyone's fighting to get the bigger piece of the turkey. That's roughly what it is when the lions are eating all the time. They just fight because they're all, they're actually all really fatties and they all just want to eat as much as they can <laughs> and they have to to survive. So some of the wounds they get from fighting with family members, some of the wounds they get them from fighting with females, and some of the wounds they get when hunting. Beautiful. Right, Chopped Elementary, it has been a pleasure having you guys with us on Drive this afternoon. Very happy we managed to see some lions and elephants and of course the ground hornbills, which is very, very cool for the afternoon. And we hope to see you again next time. But we hope that you enjoyed. <laughs> Welcome everyone to the non-school drive part of the drive, for lack of a better word. And we are here with, I think it's Tinio if I'm not mistaken. He was seen here this morning and this is where Tristan left him off and doesn't seem like he's moved too far, thankfully, for all of us because the boundary is actually not too far away from where we are, so we are very happy that he is here. Because since I've arrived at Juma, we've heard them roaring every night, so many times, just before drive starts, and by the time that you jump in the vehicle and start getting out, they have gone up somewhere else. Now, he does have a bit of a wound on his back leg, but like I was saying earlier, I don't think it's anything... I don't think it's anything too dramatic. I think I'm sure he'll be fine. And I was reading the update from, I think it was in Koro today, that apparently the other male lion actually had the worst um, side of it all. And unfortunately, um, the other male lion was actually found dead. So it seems like the Birmingham boys are here to stay, doing a very good job at defending his territory, his females and everyone around. Now, updates on the radio are funny. Because apparently I think there are two of the Birmingham boys on a buffalo, maybe I don't know if it's a buffalo, but they are on a kill somewhere on Torchwood, I want to say, not too far from here. So I wonder if this one is actually at some point going to go join them. Oh, there's a little bit of blood there. Perhaps you should. Do you have a little bit of blood on your lip now? That wasn't there before, was it? Maybe he's reopened his wound. Huh. I wonder what just happened. Maybe actually by cleaning his wound, he's actually <laughs> made it a little bit worse. Because it seems like it's all around there. But like I said, I don't think it's anything to be too worried about. Maybe if we can just... We'll just hang around a little bit more, see if maybe he's got something on his lips. Yeah, he's got some blood there that I'm pretty sure wasn't there before. Ah, thank you for opening that up. Now, if you can just move your head a little bit so we can have a look, <laughs> that will be very kind of you. Oh, the gash there on the other leg. Okay. Hadn't seen that one before. Hmm. Well, that one looks a little bit more serious than the other one, but I also still don't think that this is too bad, judging by this angle. But we'll see. Oh boy, now you've put a lot more blood. Okay, perhaps he does have a bigger injury, because now that you've raised your head like that, you've put a lot more blood on your head. <laughs> he does look like a fierce warrior now, doesn't he? Sure. I feel a little bit sorry for you now with all this blood, but I would like it if you stood up so that we could assess your wounds. Mm. Hello, boy. And uh, yes, like I was saying earlier, some of more of the updates on the radio is that the Inkahumas are on Bufalsuk after a little bit of an absence, so hopefully they'll come uh, to us tomorrow. Oh, sorry, somebody's calling Taylor, but they actually mean Ali. Standing by. It's not too far from the Bufosa uh, cut line, so you'll see it's a prominent two track and there's a Gwari branch on the road. Alright, sorry, just trying to direct somebody onto the sighting. I think we're all quite interested in trying to see where all of this blood is coming from, because I think he might have another wound somewhere in there. 
because the gash at the bottom was didn't seem the one that was bleeding all that much but perhaps what he did was actually when he stretched his leg that puncture wound that he's got there that's what he put on his face and because of the stretching and so on and because it hasn't scabbed yet maybe that's where the blood came from and boy you see you should stay around here <laughs> less lions to fight around this area <laughs> Elizabeth, you're wondering if we ever intervene when animals are hurt. Well, different parks and reserves have different policies, but in the Sabi Sand, if it's something that's caused by another animal, if it's a natural um, issue, then we do not intervene. The reserve doesn't do anything rather than let the nature take its own course. So, for example, for an injury like this, we would not intervene because sometimes it's also putting the animal under a lot of stress because a lot of the times you have to dart them and then re-dart them and they become very skittish and they don't like the vehicles. And also, I, if I've learned something by watching, particularly lions in the last few years, is that they're very resilient animals. And sometimes we get really scared because there's a lot of blood and we're really worried, but they just have a way of pulling through. They're very, actually very very strong creatures and I think that's probably where the name the king of the jungle really does apply to them. So unless it's a it's a human cause problem like for example a snare around somebody's foot or neck or ankle you, you are looking like a proper warrior now. Look at that. Then no we do not intervene. This is a natural environment and that's part of the beauty and the horrible part of it. We let uh, nature take its course and we let animals sort themselves out. <laughs> For a moment there I thought he was biting his own tail. <laughs> oh, he is pulling his tail. That is quite funny. Also getting the tail very clean. <laughs> oh, this is quite funny. A lion pulling its whole tail. <laughs> Very beautiful. So he has been cleaning himself quite a bit, so I wonder if perhaps he didn't move around and that's why there is a lot of more blood. But if you've got any questions we or any comments, we actually love hearing from everyone who's watching. So if you want to send us a tweet using the hashtag Safari Live or on the YouTube channel, we are more than happy to hear from you and address any possible questions that you may have. Like I said, we've been sitting with this male lion, which has been quite fantastic in the sense that his head is up and he's moving a little bit around and he's allowing us to see what's going on. Because often lions will sleep throughout the day and what if he were lying on the side, it would be quite difficult to actually see any of these wounds. And of course, we don't want to get that close because then we would bother it and likely he would go away and start moving. But I think the fact that he's got his head up and that he's um, cleaning and grooming himself so thoroughly could be that maybe he wants to move. Jared Burry, you're wondering what we would do with the, with the dead lion and if there's any information that gets taken from it. Yes, so whenever there's a dead lion that's found, it is reported to the conservation officers of the reserve and then they are responsible for doing a post-mortem exam of the animal. Often they will also to take the animal parts because, uh, or to try and avoid any possible um, theft of animal parts. Uh, lion bones in particular, lion skins, are the same as leopards and some other parts of some other animals, are very prized in black markets. So it's, it's a way of trying to avoid the temptation of leaving uh, the skull of a lion here and somebody else coming and eating it or taking it or selling it or whatever the case. But the first step would be, like I said, they would do a full post-mortem exam to try and find out if it died from natural causes, blood loss, etc, etc. Just to rule out any possible diseases or anything that might, um, that might be harmful for the environment or perhaps other lions that might be living in the area. Are you going to get up, boy? I think you might just get up. The weather is good. Oh, or are you, what are you doing? Are you getting up? Are you getting, going down? Are you scratching? I think Tinio hasn't quite decided what he wants to do. Perhaps he's just going to scratch for a little while. 
We are going to stick around with him just in case he does decide to move because often they will go down and carry on sleeping. But while I do that, let's go to Jamie who's got some tiny little bit lions. Well, speaking of flat lions, we've saw, we found some of our own. We are back with the Angama pride since the sausage tree pride decided to give us the slip well and truly. We are back with the Angama, or at least some of the Angama pride, including one that's decided that that tree is the best possible pillow. And then one little one off to the right, looking a little bit lost and bemused. And in fact, like it wants to get up and play more likely. I have absolutely no idea where the rest of the pride is. I assume they are off in the trees somewhere, but I'm not entirely sure. Dave, I'm sorry, but can we have another look at that lion cub that's lying on the... Tr oh, it's shifted around now. The one was lying on the tree, so beautifully using it as a pillow. It's too sweet. Well, you've got to make do with what you've got out here. Sometimes the ground Oh, sweet. Sometimes the ground's a little bit too hard, and the tree's the next best thing. So we've got four, which means we're missing 13 of the members of the Angama Pride, three lionesses and the other ten cubs are absent somewhere around here. Our plan for the afternoon will be, oh, fingers crossed, to stick with them. At the moment there we are where we can off-road. They might decide to go across the road, in which case Dave and myself will have to look for other things. And of course all of this building up to our final installment of our migration series on, well for us Saturday morning, for I think most of you it will be on Friday night. Obviously I know we've got viewers in Australia and the UK so that doesn't apply for everyone but it will be our final final TV show for the migration special at least. And then we're all going to look like that cub aren't we Dave? Three nights out here and come Saturday morning I think we're all going to be in much the same position hopefully with a pillow rather than a branch but you never know. Don't forget, because this is a live safari that you are on, to send through your comments or your questions on hashtag safari live on Twitter in much the same way that Catherine has done. Catherine, you say they are so cute. They are, aren't they? Especially, and I think it makes for a nice contrast to Ali's sighting. It sounds like there's been a little bit of drama in terms of the male dynamics in the Sabi Sands with the Birmingham boys. So it makes a nice contrast to that particular sighting. Especially that little chap. Okay, so Proud Cat Mama, we want to know roughly how old these cubs are. This one, I would say, this is one of the, gosh, we, get, we have set A, B, C, and D. <laughs> From oldest being A and D being youngest. This is C, set C, and that would make them around about, hold on a sec, about four months old, maybe four and a half months old. I'd say closer to four. The youngest set is around about three and a half months old. The older cubs, A and B, are between the ages of, I would say, around about six and a half months now and must be close to nine, the oldest set. Let me think. They looked, they were about six months old when we first, when we first got here between five and six months old and we've been here for one, two, three months. Yeah, so you're looking around about nine months old. As our lions snooze away, fortunately at peace with the world, Tinio of course has not had a very peaceful night. Let's go and see how he's doing this afternoon. Well, he is doing fine and he was actually just about to start roaring so I'm hoping he's gonna do it again because it was quite unexpected but there he, I think he is trying to get a hold of the other lions that might be not too far from from here because as far as I understand it some of them are in Torchwood some of them are around so I'm sure some of them will be able to hear him and perhaps he's just trying to get hold of them 
So I am hoping you're gonna start roaring again, boy. Are you? Fighting off the usual flies around. <laughs> We've got to give him a chance to fight off all the annoying flies. <laughs> now, I was asking Senzo. He was walking just fine this morning, so I don't think it's probably not too much to worry about because when he got up, he was looking a little bit stiff. So I wonder if he was actually not... Um, he, if he's not just actually stiff from sleeping the whole day rather than actually hurt. Because from what I understand, he walked quite a distance this morning. I think that this was a good idea to try and get to see him before before he started walking or before he pardon me before he got up and started moving around I didn't do it you're wondering if there are any diseases that affect lions psychologically like Distemper, where rabies affects lions, it's one of the diseases that affects lions quite a bit. Um, and then, well, there are all, I'm not too sure about it from a psychological perspective, but there are all sorts of other diseases that affect them. Sorry guys, one of the guys on the radio is trying to get a hold of me and he's been trying to get into the sighting, but I don't know how he missed us. So, I'm gonna switch on for you. So he is actually quite lost, and we saw him perfectly well, but him and all his guests missed us, so I'm just turning on the car so that he can hear us. But now I'm gonna turn it off because he's roaring. Negative, um, on the eastern side of the Shikoma, if you come from Hyena Road, it has my vehicle not too long ago. than a vehicle and me talking is a lion roaring to try and get people here. Thank you, Tinia. That was very kind of you. Ralph, did you get the Angola audio? quite impressive. He might be hurt, but he is very, very, very proud of making it well known to everyone that he's around here. Um, he has gone back down, so I think maybe we're gonna spend a little bit more time with him just to make sure if he stays around or if he roars again, because I strongly believe that there's nothing like the sound of a lion roaring, which is quite amazing. But while I do that, I think Jamie still with those tiny little cubs are up to a lot of nonsense. So let's go over to her and have a look. So while Ali assists whoever it is that would like to find her male lion and share that sighting with her, we've got these two starting to get up and moving about. A little male there wandering towards one of the lionesses. Oh, flop. After all that, that was just far too much effort for the day. I think the lioness agrees as well. <laughs> How innately cat-like is that? Playful, paws in the air. From a pillow to a chew toy. I would say that around about this age, he'd still be getting his teeth, his permanent teeth. And that process will continue for another couple of months.
And a warm welcome to Jared's buddy. While we watch this one cub entertain himself for now with a branch, you want to know how far the cubs will stray from each other. It is interesting to watch and something that I've really enjoyed about these nighttime safaris when we spend time, especially with the Angama cubs, to learn a little bit about the way that they interact with each other. It very much depends upon... <laughs> one's come to the other end now. It very much depends upon the the ages of the cubs and the situation that they're in so i've often seen older <laughs> tug of war older cubs wander off with the adults um, and the younger cubs instinctively know to stay behind because that's no, my stick come on sticks big enough for both of you the younger ones instinctively know to stay close to their den site in those first few weeks that they're exploring and going out and about. And then as they get older, they'll spend more and more time up, sort of following behind the adults and learning a little bit about hunting. But I've noticed when the adults leave them, when the adults actually manage to ditch them all in one go, the cubs tend to curl up all together at night. And that's actually really very valuable for the younger cubs to have older cubs present because the older ones have slightly more experience, they're slightly more alert. And you'll see that when hyenas, in the times that I've seen hyenas approach the lion cubs while the parents are away, it's the older ones that pick up on the, the, the hyenas first and they get up and run and then the little ones instinctively follow them. So that bond is actually really quite useful. And it pays if you're a younger uh, younger cub. Admittedly, you'll probably get bullied and pushed around a little bit. Oh, look at those claws coming out. There's a brief stretch there. Extending them from their sheath, his sheath. Just see the one there. So although the little cubs have to really push and fight for their place at a carcass, and they often get knocked over and bowled over, it still pays to have older cousins around you when night falls and the lionesses have to go out hunting. I mean, the hyenas, uh, not the hyenas, the lionesses will leave their cubs for hours at a time when they have to go and find food. And they'll often cover several miles in doing so. Hey girl, you contemplating a long hard night ahead? I wonder what your plans are. Not hungry. They've eaten since the last time I saw them. No, that's absolute nonsense. The last time I saw them, they were full. That was yesterday morning, Dave. Time flies. So while our lions content themselves in various poses, some peaceful, some playful, Let's go across to Tinio, who I think after his fight is giving himself a good clean. Yes, now he is, um, I believe he's done with the roaring. He just let everyone know that he's here. And how amazing was that to hear him roaring throughout the day? I just love it. It's one of the most incredible sounds in here. And lucky today, on a very cold day like today, the sound is probably going to travel further away. So he is making it very well known that even if he's hurt <laughs> and perhaps not looking at his more regal point, he's still a warrior and he's still here, ready to fight anyone that might dare come onto his territory. Now it seems like he's also got a bit of a gash on his lip, on the left hand side of his lip. There we go. Also an another bit of an extra wound, so I'm sure whatever fight this guy's had, it must have been quite a quite a vicious one. As it is normally with male lions fighting. It's never a pleasant affair to, to find more than one coalition of males with another one, because normally it's a fight to the death or it can get quite gruesome. Now I think he might have another wound underneath one of his legs, just by judging by the amount of blood, but I'm sure he'll be fine. Macy, you're wondering if a male lion's roar is l lighter, louder, sorry, than the one of a female. Yes, you can tell, it takes a little bit of getting used to you or to hear the difference between a male and a female roaring, but after a while you can pick up because the, the male's roar has got more 
I want to say more strength into it. I don't know how to put it into words. It's it's more um, guttural. It, it's more it, you can feel that it comes from deeper in. And whereas the females also roar, and it's a sound to be very scared of. It's not as loud as the one of the males. Because the females, yes, they also roar to advertise their territory. But I think there's a bit more pride in the males to to uh, when they roar just because they are advertising their presence to all of the other male lions and they are not scared of fighting but it was so unexpected to hear him roar that was i think well, my favorite surprise for the afternoon that was great and now he's gone back down so i'm gonna stick around just a little bit longer just to see if perhaps he does roar again otherwise we might try our luck with Kuchava later on because I haven't met Kuchava yet and I would definitely love to see her and I know Taylor would also like to see him so maybe we'll do this one for her as well <laughs> while we wait for this beautiful boy to finish grooming I think maybe that's gonna be your cue once he finished grooming we'll find out what he wants to do if he wants to start moving around or if he actually just wants to roar again which is what I'm hoping for, or perhaps he'll just go back to sleep. PG, you're wondering if a lion would roar even when it's injured. Um, yep, yeah, well, he is injured, and he... Sorry, um, BG, I think I got the question wrong. You're wondering if lions are afraid to fight. Is that correct, Lou? Sorry, I'm, you're breaking up a little bit, so I can't hear everything. All right, sorry, BG. Third time's the charm. Um, would he refrain from a fight while he's injured? Likely, he, yes. Likely he'll try to avoid other male lions because he is still injured and obviously he wants to get better. Or perhaps finding his brothers would also be good because as we all know, there's safety in number, even for lions. So part of the roaring could also be that he wants to try and find out where the rest of his coalition is, where the other ones are, and probably throughout the night or hopefully throughout the night, they'll meet up again and they'll find each other. So they will, um, they will become a little bit um, quieter while they are injured, especially if they have a really bad injury, because roaring also gives your position away. So if you are around and there are other younger, stronger male lions that want to try and push you away, sometimes they will just go s straight onto where they heard that roar to provoke a fight. In this case, I think he knows what the outcome of that fight was, and it's that the other two males that came from the Kruger side, I think, were, well, one of them died and the other one, I think, ran away. So he's also reasserting his territory and his dominance, and it's probably why he's not afraid to roar. Oh, hello, boy. So he is looking a little bit stiff. But that could also be from sleeping around the whole day. And you're still scratching. Imagine the power of those claws. Maybe you've got a hairball? You've been doing a lot of grooming. So I am just <laughs> trying to wishfully thank him to roar again just because it's such a wonderful sound. And when he roared earlier on, this is pretty much what he did. So I feel like if I talk, I might interrupt him. <laughs> Amazing. <gasps> Oof, that was that was really really good. And to have it roaring straight at us. I there is no feeling like quite like it. Now he's he's walking just fine. Like I said, I do think judging by when he walks, just by the blood that's underneath that he might have another wound somewhere there and he's got a little bit of a limp. 
But I think it's nothing to be too concerned about. I think part of it is probably because it's a cold day and he's a little bit stiff. So I think maybe that's why he's walking that way. Now he's heading straight um, east in this direction. So if he carries on going along that side, he's going to hit the boundary and perhaps carry on and cross over to where the other ones are reported to be. So let's follow him around and see what he does. Here comes the bundu bashing. Cheryl, you're wondering if any of the other boys have roared back yet. No, not that I've heard. I think he's... Two of them are probably going to be somewhat quiet because they've got a kill and I'm sure they don't want to share it. Hmm. I don't know which way I'm going to go around here. Um, but we haven't heard them yet. So hopefully in the next little while some of them might roar back because the Nkuhumas, I believe, are also not too far away. So the Nkuhuma girls could also start roaring back. Thank goodness for these tiny Land Rovers that allow us to get everywhere. <laughs> All right. He is, however, still scent marking. So I think this whole show that he's putting on us is just to remind everyone of who actually the boss is. Now, I'm trying to find the most open way out. Hopefully. I think this way actually because it's gonna get tricky if we follow that game path where he's walking. I hope this doesn't backfire. All right. Seems like this was actually an old two track. Woohoo! So you see in front of us he's rubbing his head against bushes, he's putting his tail up, he's scent marking, so he is doing his full territorial display. Sorry about the impromptu uh, stopping. I just wanted you guys to be able to have a look at this. So normally when lions mark their territory, that's exactly what they do. They'll put up their head and start rubbing their heads against the bushes because they've got some scent glands on their faces. And they'll use them to just leave their scent over here. And then of course they turn around and they urine spray on bushes and everything else. So roaring face marking, if we can call it like that which is also scent marking and then urine spray. The typical things that a male lion does to advertise its territory. Now, this is getting a little bit complicated in here. Ooh. Bug marker, you say that we are the luckiest people in the world to be here with this magnificent creatures. I fully agree with you. I think <laughs> I'm grateful every day. Woo, there's a big hole. Well, first of all, for not dying into a hole, but also to be able to spend as much time as we do with these animals and just hearing them roar live and being able to share it with everyone. It's, it's, a, it's very much an indescribable feeling. Now, um, Ralph, if you go around, I can't carry on forward. I think we're gonna have to find another way in. Although this one doesn't seem too bad. Mm. What do you say, Senza? Should we risk it? All right, let's let's try this out. All right. We shall carry on trying to battle the bushes and the bush do bashing and see if perhaps we can get another view of this boy because he is walking. Quite a complicated spot. Ooh, I'm hoping we're not gonna die. Woohoo! Well done, Rusty. Now, all I've gotta do is try and find out how to get through here, but while I figure this out in this gigantic puzzle, let's go over to Jamie and the beautiful, beautiful Angamas. That's not what we want at all for this afternoon safari. I'm hoping my lions don't decide to in Ali's words, book out and disappear. I'm deeply concerned by the fact that there's only four of them here. For making me wonder where the rest are. My imagination's providing me with plenty of options. Most of them are going to be tricky. Hey, sleepy cubs. Obviously, for our new viewers, you'll see that there's another vehicle in the sighting with us driving past. That's because people can come and visit this park 
who are in the Mara Triangle and on the other side of the Mara National Reserve. Tourists do come and explore through tourism tour companies or with private guides uh, or with staying with the lodges. And of course it provides a very valuable income that then goes towards conserving these creatures and keeping this land as it was intended to be as a refuge and a sanctuary for the wild animals here. And of course, the more people are out, the more eyes to spot things, to help us spot things. This lioness looks thoroughly unimpressed with life. It's just because she's nice and relaxed, but earlier on, the young, youngest cub that's here tried to suckle from her, and there was much growling and grunting and groaning from her side. She wasn't terribly impressed. Where's the rest of your family, girl? It was really quite interesting the first few weeks that I spent pretty much with the Angama Pride all the time. Almost every night we were with the Angama Pride. And what was interesting there was the way that one of them always would, would disappear around the early evening and then come back and the rest of them would follow her. It was almost, and I don't, don't, please don't take this as an absolute. It almost felt like she'd gone ahead to scout and then they, the rest of them were following her. I don't think it's nearly as simple as that, but it seemed that way. Which actually kind of links in quite well with Paula's question, who's wondering, will the Pride ever split up to patrol or to look for new territory? To look for new territory all right, this is a bit of, a bit more complex. Let me try and explain it in a way that's quite simple. Most of the time the lionesses are not looking to expand their territory. They do sort of patrol or scent mark, but only really as they're going along when they're looking for food. They don't have specific territorial routes that they walk to go walk along the boundaries. That's more a male lion thing, where male lions will actually go out on patrol and they will scrape their feet and scent mark. The prides don't really do that. They will scent mark, but it's, it's more sort of as they go along. They do roar to mark their territory, but they're not really looking to defend its borders. And prides don't tend to come into conflict, conflict as often as male lions do. Then, the situation where a lion might split away from the pride to look for new territory, it's or more territory, it's, it, it, those sorts of situations occur when you get a male takeover. So in a situation where you've got a takeover with new males coming in, you know new males kill the cubs to bring the females back into estrus and to pass on their own genetics. What often happens then is, let's say there's a couple of females in the group and only one of them or two of them have very tiny cubs that are in serious danger. Sometimes what they'll do is they will flee with those cubs and the rest of the pride stays behind, starts to mate with the new males, gets accustomed to them, and the other female will try and flee with her young cubs to try and keep them safe. Most of the time it doesn't work, but every now and again it does, and you end up with breakaway prides. Sometimes in adjacent territories, sometimes quite far away from their original prides territory. Depends how far they have to run. And sometimes if it's a really big pride, they split up when they hunt just because it makes more sense. <laughs> proud cat mama, I always wonder about that, about how the lions communicate to the cubs to stay rather than to follow them. Because it's easy to see how they tell the cubs to follow them to a kill. And they'll go up and they'll give those very soft, low contact calls and the cubs will come out going, ow, ow. Well, that, that's pretty simple to see, but how they tell them to stay, most of the time it's a signal that I would say is invisible to us as human beings, but I think that there's visual communication happening with the, with the lionesses. Sometimes what you will see, though, is with both with lions and with leopards, when they're trying to get their cubs just to stay in one place, and they're just the cubs are just being naughty and following behind them, sometimes they will turn around and give them a smack or a snarl. It does occasionally happen. But most of the time, I think the cubs also just instinctively know how to behave. All right, quickly back across to Ali because Tinu appears to be missioning out of Juma.
He is quickly missioning. We have gone across around and come onto the road. I'm sure he's gonna pop onto the road in the next few seconds or so, just because wherever he was going, there he comes, we couldn't follow. And like I said, we're not too far away from the boundary and he's heading straight for it. So I think he might be heading onto either where the Inkahumas are or where the other two male lions were. Ralph, he's here, he's just crossing the fire break now. Sorry guys, I had to keep the guys updated as to where he goes and what he's doing. Funny enough, the only way, or the only reason that I knew how to <laughs> go ahead of him and find a new way is because we had an Mvula sighting not too far from where he's been walking. <laughs> so good knowledge of the area definitely was helpful to try and avoid as many things as we could. So I'm gonna try. Yes, I'm gonna try and get in front of him just as he goes on to... Uh, just so that we can have a look, one last look at him as he comes because he's definitely gonna cross this road and then he's going to be lost to us at least because we won't be able to follow him any further. Alright Senzo, there's your money shot. Woohoo! You are such a stunning boy, aren't you? My head, my head. As you can see, he's quite close to us <laughs> and I'm just trying to get my head out of the shot. And off he goes. He's just crossing onto Bufflesick now. Beautiful. Now, I know this means nothing to the animals, but he's just crossed one of our boundaries. So unfortunately, where he's gone... Oh my goodness, are you going to sleep there? <laughs> where he's gone, we cannot follow. Or we cannot try and get a closer look of him. It's just gone static north of the Bofosa cut line. Three vehicles here. Alright, how was that? That was fairly amazing and I think maybe with that we should thank Tinio for such a spectacular performance that he's put on today and very likely just move off so we can give other people a chance to have a better view because we, I think, we've been very very lucky. I just don't want to carry on moving while everybody else moves. So we're gonna wait for some of the cars to stop moving and then we're gonna head off. But I think this was such a wonderful view of him. I'm definitely super happy that he also roared because that is probably the best thing that lions do is when they roar. Let me go. This is Bobby, you say, have a safe trip, Mr. Lion. I think maybe we should say now as well, have a nice news, because <laughs> likely that's what he's gonna do carry on sleeping. Are you done now? Beautiful. Right guys, I think we should be very thankful of what we've just seen and I think the other males are further into Bufflesook so I think it's our time to say goodbye to this beautiful Tinium and perhaps carry on see if we can or at least I can make a new acquaintance and meet the beautiful Kuchava. So we'll carry on see what else we can find along the way but not a bad time to spend our afternoon especially on a rainy day like today i think it was very very good and also of course we'll give the chance to somebody else to come because now that he's moved into the open there are a few more people that want to come and have a look so we shall leave this beautiful boy he's gone back to grooming <laughs> just making sure he's very clean and what a wonderful afternoon thank you all right we're gonna be leaving the luck of this Madonna and Gala, Ralph in charge. Perfect. <gasps> Alrighty. How was that? That was so cool. <laughs> I love it when they start roaring. <laughs> I think it's the best thing. Alright. I managed to get out of low range, which I forgot to do, but it's very necessary when you go bashing around the bush. So Kuchava, I believe, was seen somewhere around Chitta today and we are not too close to there, but we're slowly going to start making our way there. We've still got the opportunity to be surprised by pretty much anyone else. So we are going to slowly start making our way in that direction. 
while I do that, I will send you across to Jamie, who's still enjoying the company of those beautiful lions. I hope that Ali finds Kuchava and will keep you entertained while she goes off in search of a spotted cat with cats that haven't yet lost their spots, especially the littlest one. And for our new viewers, young lions are spotted, especially tiny, tiny cubs. They have very spotty coats and it helps to keep them hidden and camouflaged while they're young. And then those spots fade with time as they grow older, but they never disappear completely. So we don't tend to think of lions being spotted, but they definitely do have spots. This is the laziest example of playful behavior I think we could possibly provide. <laughs> Sleepy play. They're awake and restless, but not quite ready to be full of their normal boisterous energy. They're just going to use each other's ears as chew toys. Seems like a comfortable thing. Debbie, I really, really, it's something I know I need to get on to. I really need to do a proper head count. I f have counted at least four young males in the Angama, the, the current Angama cub collection, if you could call it that. But I haven't got a proper accurate count. Uh, I don't know whether any of the other guides have, if they've stopped and been able to have a sighting where they can. I, I've counted at least four but I honestly haven't done a fully accurate count. It's something that we're going to have to do when we get all of them gathered together. I'll tell you what, I'll try and do it tonight. I haven't spent much time with the Angamas when they've been in an area that I can off-road. So hopefully if they decide to stay here where they are, then we'll be able to do a checkout and have a look-see. So it definitely is really valuable. In terms of, of telling the story of the animals and the way that their lives progress, it really is very valuable to know just how many young males you have in a group. Because, of course, like if you have a situation with the Angamas, no, the Inkahumas is what I mean, where only one of the current one of the current set of cubs, apart not excluding the youngest ones, which obviously I haven't seen, only one of them is a male, and the same applied to their previous cubs, and you've got a situation where that poor young male, when it comes time to move off, has to move off on his own. And if he's lucky, go off and find a buddy to form a coalition with. Whereas if you've got a situation where there's three or four or five or six young males, they'll actually be able to move off together, which I think must be really, could only be considered to be an advantage. Safety in numbers, more help with the hunting, Rice, I agree. I think that this pride is particularly healthy looking and beautiful. Not that I, I've seen many unhealthy looking lions in the, in the Morris while I've been here. I've heard from the other guides that during the sort of the, the time of year where the wildebeest have vanished completely and it, apparently it, beca and it, it goes into the dry season, apparently some of the lions do get quite thin. But so far my experience has been that the lions all look very well fed and very happy. I mean, they really do look gorgeous in this golden, golden sunlight that's just decided to pop out. Nikki, if you look really closely at the cubs, obviously our lioness will never have a mane, but if you look really closely at cubs of around about six months old, you start to see just a faint fluffiness around the edges of their face and then by a year it's really quite clear that they are attempting to grow a mane. I, I always use this comparison but it always feels that way. There you go, you can see he's got a little bit of a ridge of hair along the back of his neck and just slightly fluffy cheeks. I always feel as though young male lions look like, um, look like they are attempting to grow, like teenage boys attempting to grow their first beard and you know you get the straggly patchy bits that's what young male lions always remind me of. I've got such a soft spot for them. Now they start, it grows most in the center and around the cheeks, and it's only really when they're about five or six that, they, that it fills out completely and properly. 
Mm. Between then they have a mohawk, which is quite endearing in its own way. Yes, little one. We're talking about you. I think the Angama cubs are lucky. I think they've got quite a high p percentage of males. Of course, it's great if we compare it to the Inkahumas. It's, it's great that the Inkahumas have lots of lionesses growing up to bolster their numbers. It sucks for the little male, but it's great for the pride itself. But it's nice to have a, little, a balance between the two sexes. Here we go, we've got somebody else coming to join us in the sighting. It's such a peaceful scene. And one thing I've learned from spending time with them again is that they only really get up at around about eight or so. I didn't do it. I didn't do it. You and I have had this conversation before. I'm sure that you did do it. I don't know what it was but you might have done it. I didn't do it. The simplicide age, it's a difficult one. The cubs are usually safe at around about two years old because then the, the chances are the females are going to start coming into estrus anyway. But they are still vulnerable and it depends on the dynamics of the takeover itself. Sometimes young cubs are killed, not young cubs, sometimes sub-adults are killed in that whole process um, when things get a bit out of hand, especially young males it becomes very dangerous for them in certain circumstances. Obviously the animals don't read the textbooks and there's no hard and fast rules, but around about two is when they start to be safe. Unfortunately, male lions, when they come in, when they do take over, they tend to be pumped full of aggression, testosterone, they're hyped up, they're full of adrenaline. And it's not just the cubs that fall victim, sometimes the lionesses do as well which is counterintuitive from a human perspective because they need the females to have cubs but it's just part and parcel of the dangers of a takeover. Lionesses do not like scrapping males. Even males that are fighting in amongst a coalition that the lionesses are familiar with, if they're having a fight, the lionesses either gang up against them or if they can, they try and get away. And nothing sends a lioness scurrying faster than the sound of male lions having a proper serious fight. It's always something quite tragic to witness because there's absolutely nothing. If those males catch the lioness with their young cubs, there's absolutely nothing they can do to save them. They try valiantly at times, but there's just nothing. They're not strong enough to protect them. Rishi, no, I... S okay. Let me think this through properly. So Rishi's asking about the lifespan of the lions in the Mara versus South Africa. And I would say that on average, no. The lifespans are much the same, but for one or two interesting aspects of that. One is that the lions in the Mara are treated for natural injuries. It's a different policy and it's a different approach to that applied in South Africa. So in South Africa, a natural injury like the one that Tinio has acquired would not be treated by a vet. If it's caused by a human, absolutely, but if it's naturally obtained, the policy is to let nature take its course. Here in the Mara, um, the, the lions are treated for natural injuries. Which is, of course, why our friend Scarface is still alive. He was treated for a very bad wound on his face, very bad infection. Um, so lots of the animals, lots of the lions here do get medical attention if their injury is noticed. So that would probably, I would say, hmm, no. You know what, I actually don't think it will affect the average that much. Because remember, a lot of the deaths that occur, if, you, if you're talking pure statistics, a lot of the deaths that occur are young cubs and young males. And that ha that plays out regardless. I'm not sure that the average would be that mo would be impacted. I don't think that the availability of food will make too much of a difference because remember the wildebeest are only here for a shortish period of time, less than half a year. So I don't think that's going to make a huge difference to their life expectancy. Yeah. 
Isn't that beautiful? With a shepherd's tree, one of their favourite shepherd's tree, actually, and one of the only trees I've seen them in. I've seen the cubs climb that tree. I was promised lions in trees all over the Mara. It hasn't quite worked out that way. For now, our lions are enjoying a sleep in the sun. Let's go across to Ali, whose leopard is on the move. Oh, he is on the move and unfortunately he crossed the boundary, so we're trying to try to get a bit of a view of him. But I think unfortunately we're not going to be able to get one from here. Thank you for going forward. I'm not too sure. The guys say that they... It's, I can see it from in the distance. There we go. Here, there it is. So it's a male leopard and can't really tell from the distance who it is so if you guys manage to get any screenshots and perhaps compare spots you'll be able to let us know because the guys are calling it as quarantine which would be a bit of a strange spot for him to be in Ooh, now he's gone behind he just crossed the boundary mm, come on boy just pop out somewhere where we can see you Lou says it looked like Mvula Census thinks it's Tingana <laughs> So we're all just shouting names out in the wind. I wonder which one it is. The only thing that we seem to agree upon is that it's a male leopard. Um, and now I wonder where he's gone off to. Megan, she says it's Shungile. Definitely not. <laughs> Definitely not too big. Um, so Megan, we won't trust you for leopard IDs anymore. Let's try to... Oh, he's static now. Cubby. No worries, Mike. I'm gonna see if maybe I can get a view from the from the cut line. All right. Apparently he's gone static somewhere in there. Well, I cannot see him. Hmm. Sneaky leopard. All right. Seems like Brent has managed to find the jackpot of animals, and I think unfortunately we won't be able to have a look at our friend from here because I have no idea where he's gone off to. And it's a bit of a complicated one but at least we managed to have a bit of a glimpse up some spots for the day which is quite amazing and i'm very happy about it but i think maybe we'll stick to our plant and go all the way to chitua so we'll bid goodbye to this leopard over here and let's go over to brent for some unfolding action welcome back and we are way down south in the mara triangle i got a report uh, from one of my friends who's guiding from Serena and he said you've got to go you've got to go you've got to go there's lion and leopard in the same place the leopard has just disappeared behind this termite mound um, oh no there she is it's the we're not very close to her at the moment um, due to the fact that she's down in a little lugger and it can make our signal and comms a bit difficult but there she is that looks like the Magia Chafu female but I said we are quite far from her now she is slinking. Uh, she's already been put up a tree once today by the Purungat Pride. And they're just on the other side of that lugger she's walking down. Um, Craig's just going to show you where they are. They're all lying there and there's about uh, about 14 or 15 lions spread out through this area. Well, there's more lions over there. Oh my goodness, they are. So she's actually got lions on both sides of her. There's more lions. It looks like lions over there. Yep, those are lions. Okay, let's just... Where has she disappeared to now? I'm just going to try to find her again. She's sneaking along the edge of the lugger. For those of you wondering what a lugger is, it is um, a little depression uh, that holds water uh, seasonally. Where has she gone? Of course, she's, she's moving quite stealthily to try and avoid all the lions that are around here. Let's see if she's got a bit further down. Remember, this is coming to you 100% live from Kenya. Oh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go a little bit higher up the hill so I can see a bit more. Because, oh, there she is. There she is. There she there she is, on that big termite mound. She's trying to check where the lions are. Sorry about that, Craig. Hi, 
Hi, Melissa. Melissa's wondering if the Safari Live team has ever spotted a menalistic leopard. And the answer to that, Melissa, is an unfortunate no. It would be very exciting. They are incredibly rare. Uh, I have seen one in my whole life, and that was for about five seconds as it dashed across a road. Oh, no, she's just disappeared behind that termite mound. I don't think she's going to cross the lugger. I think she's just trying to keep uh, in an area with the most cover. And she's going to be moving very cautiously and checking every every little every moment. Because there's two male lions there, and at least four lionesses on the other side. A bunch of cubs. There she is. Out. She's out on the move again just to the right of where she was. There she is. Now, I don't know if she knows about the lions that are on this side that we saw behind us. Where'd she disappear, Craig? She went back towards the lugger. Proud cat mama is wondering are leopards faster than lions? Uh, indeed, they are over a short distance. Um, they have a, a, a better sprint, but not by much. Um, and, oopsie, there's a big termite on there. Let's just do this. Uh, lions are also very quick, but what a leopard normally relies on is its, its ability to climb trees. And I heard that's exactly what she did to get away from them earlier today. She climbed a tree that's just up there, and she's now come down it, and she's slinking along. I've just lost sight of her again. Fortunately for her, the lions seem to have no interest at the moment. I hope she didn't cross, because it's quite a long way to find a spot to cross this lugger. We'll, we'll see shortly. I've got her again. Let me just go forward. Jan says it doesn't look like there are many trees for her to climb, for her to be safe. Uh, Jan, you would, it's unbelievable what size tree a leopard will climb to get away from lions. They can go up the smallest of smallest trees. Just had her for a brief second. You can see she doesn't know about these lines in front of us here. I think there's actually more than I initially thought. One, two, three. So there we go. There's three at least. There could be a few more. Dory's wondering, do I think she's on? The oh, you see more, Craig? I think that was a bone. Is it a bone? It's a bone. Um, Dory's wondering, is she moving up? to find a tree to climb. I don't think so, Dory. She's moved down from a tree and she's basically just now trying to put distance between herself and the lions. Let me just have a quick look. Can you see her? I'm just going to have a look at my barners and my far lookers. I don't see her. She was off to the right of where you are, Craig. There she's like, oh, she's crossed the lugger. <coughs> oh, she is gorgeous. So she's crossed the lugger. Now, that doesn't mean there are no lions still. I mean, this is a big pride, and it's very spread at the moment. Let me go forward a bit.
Hi, LM. LM is wondering, how would lion cubs react to a leopard if they got left behind because the pride went hunting? Now, it all depends on the age of the cubs. If they're very young cubs, the leopard would actually kill them um, to try and remove that predatory competition that happens so often out here. Here we go. Here are these other three girls, all looking relatively well fed. Hi, girls. Oh, she's a pretty lioness, this one here. Oh, doesn't like you moving the camera there, Craig. There we go, she's calmed down now. I think she was just very fast asleep. Oh, you are gorgeous. Pretty, pretty lion. Now, I'm still just waiting for the leopard to pop out. Lots and lots of lions in this valley at the moment. Oh, that is beautiful. Late, late afternoon light just seeping through and giving us the most gorgeous picture of this girl. Beautiful. Christina is wondering, will leopards use the vehicle as cover? They might, Christina, but I think she would prefer to use the lugger. Um, because of that water there, and there are trees and bushes that she might be able to scramble into to get away from the lions. Let's just have a quick look from here. Great us. Behave like a topi. Are you ready to be a topi, Craig? We're going to go up onto the termite mound to see if we can see a big cat. We are just we are just toping about the Mara at the moment. Let's have a quick look if I can spot her again. Yeah, well, I'm going to try find this leopard again. While I do that, let's go back to Ali and see what she's up to. Whew, seems like Brent has found himself a very interesting yet very oh, so much tension. I wouldn't want to be that poor leopard caught in between two prides of lions. That that would be quite something. Um, we are on our way to hopefully see a leopard, also a female leopard. Um, which is known by the name of Kuchava, which means scared or skittish because she apparently used to be quite scared of vehicles when she was younger, if I'm not mistaken. But I remember Tristan saying this morning that she's grown quite a bit and she doesn't seem to be as bothered by vehicles and people approaching her as much as she used to be. So we are carrying on to Chitwa. The wind is howling at the moment, but luckily we've got many layers upon us to keep us warm and of course we've got the expectation of hopefully seeing a leopard down there now unfortunately radio communication is not the greatest so i don't know if she's been seen this afternoon i would assume she is because she had a kill this morning a diker which is a small species of antelope if i'm not mistaken so as i get a little bit closer then i have to jump onto the radio and chat to the guys and find out what's been happening and if she's still around and where she is if she is still around so not too far now or at least starting to get to an area where I might get some radio comes with some of the guys on the other side which would be very helpful in terms of <laughs> letting me know if she is still there Ooh, very cold oh hang on while we do that very interesting sighting here we've got a cocky Franklin calling and this might be the same one that we saw earlier today but yesterday sorry but they are actually <gasps> I'm going to be quiet so we can hear him calling. This is the male. And there's another one in the distance that's responding. So just like the lions, just like the lions were roaring, also birds are territorial and they have these beautiful songs to do, do just that, to advertise their territory in their particular domain in an area. How cool is this? Beautiful. So there are quite a few that are responding in the distance. 
which just gives away the presence of a lot more all around us. Huh. Look at those beautiful feather pattern. It's very hard to hear the other ones responding, but maybe a hundred, hundred meters, fifty meters away from us, probably less. But when this one calls a few seconds afterwards, the other ones start responding. We might not be able to hear them because the wind is playing its tricks against us. Oh, hello, beautiful boy. You're gonna start again. I don't want to talk because I don't want to disturb them and it's it's so rare that we actually get them to, to see them so nicely in the open and calling as well huh. are you done now? <laughs> there was a female hanging around here but you can just make up their feathers every every now and again or there she goes at the back and very likely these guys are also starting to go into their mating season. It is spring after all, so it's the time of the year where love is up in the air and everywhere around. So I wonder if perhaps they're not going to have a little bit of a... Um, if they're going to have a nest somewhere around here, which would be very nice. Because we came around here yesterday and we saw them in the afternoon, so it's a good spot to start um, looking for them. It would be amazing if we get tiny little Franklins just running around in a few months' time. <laughs> well, that was a very nice spot little roaring creature you two thank you for that huh that was very nice i have never ever heard a cocky franklin call before or at least not so close to us and that was just fantastic that was wonderful <laughs> i'm very happy about that now going back to the leopard we saw earlier i apologize that we didn't manage to have a have a, a better a better look at it but it's always the thrill of oh, there's a leopard and it's going away you know we managed to see a few spots which is always exciting and a lot of the times well we get spoiled here because we get to see so many animals up close but for a lot of people that is a once in a lifetime sighting just to see some of the spots moving around so I'm actually happy to know that there is a male that's going around there whoever he might be because <laughs> I think it's gonna be a bit of a tough one to try and ID him but uh, hopefully He'll come around maybe tomorrow. We'll can give him until tomorrow a bit of a break. Ooh, the wind is howling now. Wind, you need to stop now because I can't hear anything. All right, now, according to what I was told earlier on, which I was not too far from here, so I'm gonna try and jump on the radio in the next few moments to try and find out if she's still around and where she is. Because that'll be quite nice to try and find her. And obviously try and see her because I haven't seen her. The closest I ever got was at one time that uh, Tandi and Tingana were sharing a kill or well we actually think that Tandi made the kill and then Tingana came and stole it from her and he and they were together at some point and I believe that earlier that morning Kuchava was around and Tandi and Kuchava were fighting but I never got to see her because she obviously fighting with Tandi she pretty much got a fright and, and walked away and, and ran somewhere else so I never saw her so fingers crossed we'll be able to see her this afternoon now let's see and who knows maybe we'll find her a very strange mystery bird we sent it to one of the one of the most famous birders in South Africa which runs in uh, a rare bird list his name is Trevor Hardiker and he's got very like a vast knowledge of bird IDing and so on and his choices were also amongst a booted eagle and a pale morph Wahlberg's eagle so I think the mystery remains but now that we know that it lives somewhere around this area hopefully we'll be able to see it again and then perhaps get a view of the tail and find out Cool. I'm going to try and jump onto the radio and speak to everyone to find out um, where Kuchava is and what's going on. But while I do that, I'm going to send everyone back across to Jamie because I believe her lions are still looking very beautiful and very pretty. And any time that's spent with in the company of any wild animal is probably the best time to be spending any day of the day. So let's
So while Ali goes off in search of her lovely lady leopard, Kuchava, my goodness, it seems as though Tandi and her offspring have really, truly moved in. We are still sitting with our lovely Angamas. What you will have noticed, of course, is that we have switched cameras. So we've switched to our low light camera that makes use of every ounce of available ambient light. At the moment, it's still basically light enough for us to have used the other camera. But what we've learned, the lessons we have learned, haven't we, Dave? is that you got to switch these cameras when you have the chance. It takes a little bit of time. Um, I timed Darby just now and it was around about 15 minutes and 48 seconds. I didn't time you, Darv. Um, but either way, it takes some time. And what's happened to us about three or four times, I think, in total in the time that we've been in Kenya with these cameras is we've missed a hunt because we've left it too late and the animal gets up and then it's a disaster. And even if we haven't missed a hunt, if they start to move, poor Dave's got to swap around cameras. You've got to perform some magic juggling act with a camera that weighs... How much does that camera weigh, Dave? Gee. Gee. At least 12. Darby says at least 12 kilograms, so over 25 pounds. It is not a small, small device. It's quite serious. So we've done our swap, which means that my voice is now going to be disembodied for the rest of the drive. Tweety Tweet, it's one of those fascinating things about lion dynamics. So Tweety Tweet is asking about how a young male would approach another young male with the intent of forming a coalition. And that's the nice thing about male lions, is that they're not fussy. The advantage of having a buddy with you, or more than one buddy, is worth overcoming one's um, reservations about having somebody that's not, or an, another lion that's not related to them involved in in their coalition. So basically what will generally happen with them is they will go and they'll sit at 200 meters or 150 meters apart, 100 meters, 150 yards apart, and they'll stare at each other for a while. And then one of them will go up closer and then they'll stare at each other for a while. And then gradually they become used to each other, then one of them will kill something and the other will come to share it. And then there'll be a lot of growling and the occasional scrap but because they're not, at that point, they're generally not dominant, their instincts don't tell them to go in for a really serious fight. They don't want to injure themselves. And eventually, through that process, they establish a kind of odd buddy relationship that then becomes actually a really loving partnership for the rest of their time as in that coalition. And sometimes it's, it's two, sometimes it's three, but they do form coalition between unrelated males. Something fascinating I once witnessed many years ago when I first started working in the bush, and I was 19 years old, just finished school, and I was working out in the Kalahari with some people who, who would be considered to be the foremost expert in lion behavior in South Africa. And one of the things that they did was, because it was a closed system, the animals couldn't wander off and, and control their own dynamics. They had to do some control in ter terms of moving lions around to prevent inbreeding. And as a result, there was a young male lion that, that was brought in and a young male lion that was brought in from somewhere else to keep the genetics fresh. And they put them together in a closed enclosure before they were released. And the vet who was performing this whole operation walked up to one, while it was sedated obviously otherwise this would not have been a very good idea and rubbed its face with a with a cloth then walked back to the other one and rubbed its face with the same cloth and then repeated the process a couple of times till they were well and truly covered in each other's scent and in that way because both of them were going to wake up in an enclosure in that way they were actually wake up and not get into a fight the moment they laid eyes on each other and from then on that coalition once they were released back into the wild were a coalition for life. Makes sense for lions to do that. You really don't, you don't really want to be a young male on your own trying to make a name for yourself or score a territory as it were. I think we can get a little closer now actually, come to think of it. I should have done that a while ago but I didn't think about it. I've been keeping my distance but now we're alone 
think we're alone now, Dave. Everybody else has gone home. And we are out here. Hello, guys. Why don't you tell me where the rest of your pride is? There we go. That really is quite lovely. I apologize for those of you that get motion sick. <laughs> it's just one of those things. That wasn't too bad, though. I really want the rest of the Angamas to come out here. So, Nilia, sorry, I was just, I was distracted by the thoughts of where the rest of the lions are. You want to know how many species of lion there are in Africa? There are there is only one species. Okay, so there are no separate species at all within Africa. There's a lot of argument about the subspecies of Africa. And, you know, obviously you get the Asiatic lions, and then you get the the Southern African lions, the Western African lion population, the Eastern African lion population. And there is very much a a difference that you can see in terms of the coloration of the, of the manes, the size, the... But their behavior is, pr is pretty constant, in Africa at least. So you do get different subspecies, but it's always, always a matter for debate. People, scientists are constantly arguing the subspecies species distinction. It's not an easy line to draw. And you'll read one article saying one thing and one article saying something else. I have got this highly devastated feeling that the rain is on its way, which of course is going to cause chaos for our nightly plans. But while I contemplate that awful reality, let's go across to Ali, who is sitting at a waterhole. We did come to... Ooh. To Chitwa's water hole, uh, we have to wait to be able to get a spot to go and see Kuchava, but I don't think it's going to be too long. But in the meantime, why not spend some time at probably one of the biggest water sources around? Now it seems like we caught the zebras just as they were finishing drinking, and now they're heading all the way back into much warmer areas. But it is quite funny. This last one walking around, it seems to be the bus for all of the oxpeckers that it's got on top of it. At one point, we counted about five different ones. <laughs> So it seems like maybe he's the chosen one to be the chariot of all the tiny little oxpeckers that walk around here. And if you're wondering what the oxpeckers are, those are those little birds on his back and their main job is to eat the ticks and all the tiny little parasites that might be living on top of the zebra. Now this particular zebra has gone off and it seems like everyone's heading off as well. But the waterhole is such a lively place that I wouldn't want to leave them just now because the zebras are also going to cross the road and head into an area where fortunately it will be hard to see them. Although you look a little bit pregnant, miss. Or missus. I apologize if I offended you. That is quite funny. From behind the tree, nothing. From the other side of the tree, all the zebras are emerging. And I would say there are... There's maybe one that's looking quite fat, even for a zebra, because they always appear to be fat, but that's just because they are bloated. Their digestive system produces a lot of gas, a lot of fermentation going on to try and break down the cellulose and all of the, the substances in within the grass that they eat. So they always appear to be just fat. Where are you guys carrying on? Just one youngster with you. But having said that, I think there's one in particular that looks like all that fat might not be food and juice, but actually from a tiny little zebra that might be forming inside. And you? Are you being a rebel and not crossing the road? Richie, you agree saying fatty, well-fed zebras? Well, yes, I think <laughs> they're doing just fine. And hopefully now that we've had quite a bit of rain, or that we're going to have some green shoots of grass that are going to come along, and everyone's going to be a lot happier, and it's going to be eating a lot more. That'll be quite spectacular. 
and I would feel a lot better for all of them once we see them that they can all have something to eat. Oof, there they go. Seems like today has been the drive of the disappearing zebras <laughs> and all their different tactics and what they do, just walking around behind one of the bushes and then they go. Now earlier on there was a tiny little uh, blacksmith plover chick running around but I haven't been able to see it again and it's about probably this big so it's still very very tiny looking very funny around but already making that constant ding 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 noise that the, that the blacksmith make. So I think maybe we're gonna try going a little bit forward see if perhaps we can see it again because they look very funny. Oh, <laughs> guinea fowl. I'm gonna hear out for a second. Let's go exploring because it seems like some of the guinea fowl are quite upset. And normally, when guinea fowl start making that call, sometimes it's because um, there's a potential predator around. So, who knows? Maybe there will be another leopard around here. That would make me very happy. But I first need to try and figure out where they are calling from. I've heard them call from that area so many times before and it's led to nothing. So hopefully this time I'll be wrong and one of them will be around. Let's see. I do think that there is a road that goes in that general direction. So we're gonna have go have a look. Let's see. Alrighty, let's look. Sorry, the radio is... Right. Sorry, Zebra! Sorry! Okay, I copy. Alright, I want to find this road that going around but I think maybe this road is actually too far away and I've perhaps should have gone around the drainage line hmm that's what happens sometimes but who knows let's give it a try I know that Hosanna likes this area Tandy might be around although I don't know where she was seen this morning or if she was seen this morning so let's go exploring while we wait for our next leopard I think it's a good idea hopefully we'll get lucky with something and it's always worth exploring where guinea fowls are alarming and they have this funny call and whenever you hear it you just stress because it's da 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 <laughs> well clearly not something like that but you get the idea and funny enough I've had them going crazy here at Chitu Dam um, a few months ago but they were all on the ground going crazy alarming and we spent a huge amount of time there just looking maybe there was a snake um, wildcat servo something and we could not find anything but there was clearly something that was upsetting them i was so convinced that it was a leopard back then because they were just they wouldn't stop but no idea what it was so i think i'm gonna just carry on a little bit around this area and see if maybe maybe there's anything around here i can still hear them see them. Uh, let's see. Uh, we're getting closer. I know there's a drainage line not too far from here and perhaps that's where they're calling from. There we go. I can hear you. Okay. Are you guinea fowl? Ah, you were on the tree. Let's have a look around here. So, guinea fowl, we're looking in this direction. They could also be potentially alarming at a bird of prey. But I just want to have a look around because you never know what would be around the next corner like we saw today. There was a sneaky leopard not too far from where we were. Why have you shush now, guinea fowl, when we need you? Hmm. Seems like maybe guinea fowl were just playing with us. Hmm. Nothing anymore. All right, let me just 
bit of, more of a look around around here, just perhaps in case we've missed something. If I put the car into gear, that would help. Ooh, sorry, Senzo. Nothing. We are ooh, going to try and have another look around here. Maybe just be quiet for a little while. See if maybe we can hear the guinea fowl alarming again. Maybe they'll point us in the right direction. Otherwise, they've just gone completely quiet. Hmm. Puzzling. They, the guinea fowl at Chitwa Dam always confuse me. Anyway, we're going to carry on trying to find them. But while we try to find them, let's go to Jamie, who's already in the best possible company. I do apologize. You caught me right in the middle of a mouthful of, of snacks. I'm just going to finish chewing my nuts quickly. Hmm. Apologies. <laughs> it's a bad choice of snack there, Dave. <laughs> okay, well, fortunately the camera can't come back to me, so I can ignore the, the bits of nuts. Now, we're still with our lovely Angama lioness and the three cubs. We haven't moved much, to be completely honest. In fact, we're still sleeping peacefully. Heather, no. The lions in a, of a lioness is in a pride actually don't have a strict hierarchy in the way that you get in something like a hyena clan. So the hyena clan is strictly governed by the dominant females, led of course by the matriarch who is the, the most dominant of the group. Whereas with lionesses, they, they don't have a strict hierarchy. <coughs> it tends to be that the older females will be the ones that I've noticed get up and move the lions to a different place, move the pride to a different place. But there's no real set pattern and there's no real set movement. Obviously the older ones have slightly more experience and the younger ones are accustomed to following them. But when it comes to hunting, and that hunting is often initiated by the younger lionesses. They seem to be the one, especially when they when they sort of just reach sexual sexual maturity, they they seem to be the ones that initiate the hunts the most frequently. So no, there's no set set pattern or hierarchy to the way in which lionesses function. And they very, very seldom scrap between pride members. You don't see that. The only time they might snap at another female is if, if they have very young cubs and perhaps she gets irritated with them or something like that. But otherwise you don't really see fights between the members of the same pride. It's one of the things that makes lion pride so very special, in my opinion the love that they have for each other. And you can always see, and I've noticed it with this lioness as well, as she gets up every now and again. Even, although she is, she's quite content to be separate from the rest of her pride mates, she does keep looking in the direction that I think the rest of them are in. And they always seem to be more content when they are all together. And you can always see it when a lioness comes back from a solo hunting mission or wherever she has happened to be, you can see how eagerly she greets her pride mates. The same applies when she's in estrus because of course she stays with the male the entire time. And you can really, really see it, especially towards the end of her estrus cycle. You can clearly see she wants to get back to the rest of the pride and the male just keeps following and keeps following and blocks her. But to me it's very apparent. But that's what lionesses and estrus want to do. PT, yes, that is a possibility. I mean, these lions are very accustomed to the presence of vehicles around them. You can see it. I mean, they're sleeping peacefully and I'm sitting probably about 60 feet or so away from them. So they're very comfortable with us. But yes, it is a possibility that if a lioness has very young cubs and we were to drive in too fast or aggressively or in the direction of the cubs and, and we made a lot of movement and a lot of noise, when the cubs are very young, yes, there is a possibility that the lioness would go for the car. It might just be a growl. It could be a, a warning, a warning charge, tail lashing and ears back and sort of much, a lot of very deep sounds and there is a slight, very slight possibility 
that she could actually take serious offense to us. That is very, very unlikely, though. And, of course, because we've, all of us have been doing this for many years, we're exceptionally careful in those situations. And those sorts of sightings are sensitive, and they require discretion. And sometimes it might just be that the lioness has had a really bad night and she's, her cubs have been threatened by hyenas or whatever it happens to be. And you've got to constantly be watching her body language because that is a small but distinct possibility. And if you look back at the moments that all of us have spent with, the, with lion cubs, tiny, tiny lion cubs, particularly when they decide we never go too close to lion cubs. They, 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 we put ourselves in a position where they can choose to come past us if they want to. Um, but if you, if you look back on, on those moments where you've been with young cubs, you'll notice that we, we often go, we, we drop this volume of our voices, we whisper. Sometimes when the cubs are very close to the car, you'll hear us tell um, the, the guys who are in camera with us, although they're, they're equally good at gauging animal behavior, but we might tell them to just be quite still or to keep their movements very slow. It's important for us to never get blasé about the animals that we spend time with, partly because we're privileged enough to spend time with them, and secondly because they are wild, and that makes them to a degree unpredictable. Yes, we can read their body language, but it always pays to have a degree of awareness Scottish blueberry? No. Unfortunately, when it's time for the cubs to eat meat, the lioness doesn't chew or soften it in any way. And in fact, she doesn't even clear a space at the dinner table for them. From the age of about six weeks, which is when the lioness will start to take the cubs to kills, they have got to learn to fight for their place at the kill. And fortunately, mom is still lactating and she'll continue to lactate for several months after that. But the little cubs just have to learn to fight their way, and if they don't, then they get the scraps. And nobody chews it up for them, nobody softens it. Their little teeth are like needles, and it's a great way for them to develop the jaw strength that they're going to need in the future. So no, mom doesn't chew it up. And in fact, none of the predators really do, except for wild dogs, where wild dogs will actually gulp down the meat and then they regurgitate it for the little pups. And most predators wean very quickly. In that kind of situation, it makes sense because the, to, to lactate is to, requires, a, a, you know, it has an impact on the female's body and her energy and her resources. And because they never know when their next meal is coming from, you'll find that predators are not necessarily weaned quickly, but they're certainly introduced to meat at a very young age. <laughs> that was cute. A little Pilates move there. Both feet over in one go. I love watching them sleep because you can see them dreaming. When their little paws twitch. Jamie, you'll find that with all animals, the younger ones will tend to sleep more. Um, that, that difference is not as easily seen in the lion pride because lions, for the most part, lions sleep a lot. They can sleep up to 20 hours a day. Uh, I would say that on average, they probably sleep far less than that. I mean, we see when we sit with the Angamas or with any other lion pride, we see them we stick with them moving usually for about five or six hours at night once it gets dark. I'd say that it's around about 12 o'clock or 1 o'clock in the morning that they tend to settle down. And then if they haven't eaten, they, they often go all night. But yes, it, it, they're on average, it's a bit less than 20 hours, but they can sleep for up to 20 hours a day, adults included. And in fact, the, the youngsters almost seem to be more energetic than the adults when we get to spend time with them and sit with them because it's usually in the first thing in the morning or at night and the cubs are very playful. But as a rule, babies need more sleep than adults. Youngsters need more sleep than adults.
Well, youngsters and adults doze alike. Let's go and find out whether young Kuchava is asleep or wide awake. Well, it seems like he, she is asleep. We're just waiting a few seconds because we can already see the area where she's in, but there are already three guys here. So I'm waiting for one of them to come out so that we can go in because apparently as they were turning, the guest just wanted to snap the last few photos and she is quite asleep, so she's not gonna go anywhere. So we're just gonna give it maybe about 10 seconds, hopefully before I start the car and ask them politely to make space for us once more. Luckily for us, there doesn't seem to be too much of a chance of her going anywhere. And I am hoping that he's gonna come out now. Come on, Ryan. Sorry, sometimes this is a thing that happens whenever you are at a sighting. You can sit there all the time and just as soon as you are about to leave, as soon as you turn the car and change slightly the angle, then all of a sudden that's the best shot of your life. And obviously you need to take about a thousand more. <laughs> so, um... We're just gonna wait a few more seconds. They were coming out, but I think maybe they got another interesting angle from wherever it is that they were sitting. So, like I said, let's just give it a few more seconds. Hopefully they'll move out and make space for us once more. Good news is though, it seems like she put the kill up the tree, which is a very good sign that she won't lose it to anything around. And I'm not too sure, because again, the radio is doesn't always work with us, but I have a feeling that she might be up the tree and that would be very, very interesting and very nice to see her up the tree. Now, I am hoping she is actually up there, and because if I, she's not, then I'm involuntarily <laughs> lying to all of you. Not because I would want to, but because I really want to see a leopard up a tree. And that's what the guy said, so hopefully, all right. All right, cool. Let's go in. Ooh, okay, the excitement doesn't let me drive. Let's go back in low range and off we go. All righty, let's see where you are. New leopard for me. Hopefully this will also be a new leopard for a lot of us because I don't think she's... She doesn't come onto our areas or places where we can see it all that often so she's a little bit hard to spot sometimes. Now... She is in all royalty <laughs> sleeping on top of the branches of the dead tree feeding on her kill. So Senza, let me know when it works for you. I think this works here and it will be a very nice frontal visual of her. <gasps> Look at that. Seems like we got here just at the right time. Oh, she's got a diker and I think she's trying to reposition it and move it somewhere else so she can carry on feeding on it. Ooh. There are a bit of a few branches in the way but hopefully we'll be able to get around them just a little bit later but let's just let her settle now that there's been a bit of movement all around and we'll be able to to go around and have another look at her. But how amazing! <laughs> Hello, new leopard! Very happy to meet you! She is a stunning individual and looking very full, I should say. And she's actually... She seems to be quite bigger, although it could be the angle that she's in. But I have a feeling she's slightly bigger. Look at those claws that just that power and she's doing exactly what Shadow was doing when we saw her the other day with the cub and the steamboat kill look how she's taking all of the hair uh, all of the hair out of the of the skin of the diker just to be able to get to the soft part to the skin and then be able to cut through there and get to do all the meat that because obviously that's what uh, that's what she's interested in and there went all the hair <laughs> falling down but if she's not careful she might even drop this kill because it seems like it's hanging just by a little bit of a thread, so to speak, and she's just holding it together all the way up there. Lucky for her, I don't see any hyenas around, so even if she drops the kill, she could just very well go down, fetch it, and then grab it and put it back up on the tree. It's a very long job trying to eat their prey. So if you imagine for a leopard, they spend endless hours trying to hunt. I mean, we've seen Hosanna, 
trying to stalk and hunt for so many times and Shadow and Tandy and all of them and they do it for quite a while and they're not that successful. Their success rate is probably about maybe 40-50% if anything. And uh, once they do manage to get the animal down or to bring it down and hunt it, now she's actually fed on it, she's opened it and now she's taken it all the way up there. But her job doesn't just finish there, now she's going to carry on plucking the hair and trying to get to the meat. So. <laughs> quite a long process for them to try and get all the meat and all the nutrients that they need to carry on surviving. So I think we, we just tend to think that it's the, the stock that is the longest part, but I think we don't give the, the treatment of the or the preparation of the meal enough consideration. Just because they also they spend a lot of time taking the hair out, taking the stomach out, trying to cut through the skin to get to the meaty parts. And it is getting a bit of a it's a bit of a strong view, very raw, so if you are not entirely comfortable with what we are watching, please do look away. Um, this is the way our leopard survive and it's this is why it's, it's nature and it's a very raw visual of what it is. And on the one hand, obviously we are very happy that she's able to feed, because, but unfortunately for everything that lives, something else dies. <laughs> That's very gloomy, Senzo. <laughs> maybe she's managed to position it a little bit better on the tree and it seems like she's got it safe up there. Cheryl, um, you are wondering how old this leopard is. I'm not a hundred percent sure so I'm sure a lot of viewers will be able to help us out using the hashtag Safari Life but if I am not mistaken she is the previous litter to Tamba. So I'm gonna guess around two or three if she is actually the one that the, the, the litter previous to Tamba, otherwise I could potentially be very, very, very wrong. Um, but like I said, if anyone wants to help out and let us know, I am more than happy to learn about a new leopard that obviously other people have been following for, for a while longer than what I have. And that is the beauty of this community that we have. Seems like she's still quite a... She's got a lot of the meat still left around there, especially in the hind quarters. Are you gonna take it up? Oop. Yeah, that's she's on a dead marula, so parts of the bark are falling down as she moves around. So I think maybe that's why she's trying to move it, just to make sure that she's got a bit of a better grip and the bark doesn't fall with her and the kill. Hmm. I'm gonna wait for this car to stop moving and maybe we'll try to get a bit of another look. Although if she raises her head, it's quite nice because then we've got full on view of her exactly like this. Thank you. Very kind of you. Hmm. Very clever leopard putting your kill all the way up there. So in areas where there's a lot of pressure from other predators, it's particularly um, hyenas, the leopards, or most of the leopards, although Shadow's a bit of a um, special case, they tend to put their kills on top of the trees because pretty, mu pretty much nothing else will get to them. So you see, <laughs> She's hiding actually quite well on a very dark day like today. If you look from a distance and the way her the, the color of her skin and the kill that she's got there, it's pretty much impossible to know that she's actually here. So luckily the guys managed to find her this morning and now we get to spend some time with her in the evening. Woohoo! <laughs> Beautiful. Take care, you're wondering if leopards open the skin of their prey using their claws or their skin. Well, in this case, if you're wondering because you, we saw that she had her paws on top, that uh, the paws are mainly just to grip to make sure that the kill doesn't fall. But to open or to cut through the skin, they actually use their teeth. Particularly the back teeth, because the way that the teeth of a, of a leopard are put in their mouth is the same as a domestic cat or a duck and it, it's actually that whole uh, position and it's called carnation shear and it allows the, the leopard to cut through the skin almost as if its teeth were scissors. So that's why you see that the hell tilts down on the side and she's using the molars at the back to just cut open that skin and be able to get through the meat. So they they use their mouth rather than their than their claws to try and open it up.
Raisa, James and Hini, you all say that Kuchava is three years old. Woohoo, so I wasn't too far off in my, uh, my calculations. So she is still a very young leopard and this would be Tamba's older sister, uh, sister. And Tamba is a young male leopard that we also get to see in our traverse area. Uh, and we've actually been seeing it a lot with their mother, Tandi. Now, she's still, like we said, very, very young still for, <laughs> for a leopard and hopefully she'll have a very long life ahead of her. And I look forward to maybe spending some more time with her. She's been found on Chitu a few times and it always seems like she started pushing a little bit more onto this area while Tandi has been pushing a little bit more into, into Juma now that Karula has been gone. So there, I think that there's going to be a little bit of a shift in leopard's territory and hopefully um, it'll be a good one in the sense that we'll be able to include maybe some other leopards that we don't see as often. <coughs> Seems like it's been a fantastic cat day today. Don't, isn't, is today Wednesday? Don't they call today Wildlife Wednesday? <laughs> I think today has been a proper day. But while we try to perhaps find a new angle to see if maybe we can see her a little bit better, we're also going to go back to Jamie who's still hanging around with lions, but hanging around with lions in the dark. All of the cats indeed. Leopards, lions. Yep, that's it. <laughs> I was trying to think if there was something else, but no, that's it for today. <clears throat> Although, who knows? I know that Mr. Dyson has gone across to the other side of the river in search of the five cheetah boys. So who knows what the night holds for us. Hunting cheetah, hunting lions, some more Angama cub cuteness. And they really are terribly sweet. One thing I would love to show you, which I haven't really had the opportunity to do, is when the Kichwe males come a-calling. They come and visit the Angamas, and it's hilarious to watch. I don't know exactly what it is about the dynamics with this particular group, because they are, of course, suspected to be the fathers of these cubs. They certainly think they are. And the cubs invariably, in their curious young way, will go running off at the males. And then the males absolutely panic. Obviously because the females have been beating them up every time they go near the cubs. So as soon as the males see the cubs coming, they turn tail and they run away. And they go and lie down and the cubs get brave again and they get closer and closer and closer. And then the male gets up and runs even further away. It's quite entertaining to witness. Hey ladies. Well, lady, I don't know what you did to those males, but they're scared of you. I wonder how this night is going to go. Are we going to get lucky? Are the rest of the pride going to come and find her? Or not? Looks as though they're going to continue to sleep. Is that my stomach or the lion? Lloyd, I have never had an animal jump into the vehicle with me. I know of a, I have a few friends um, who've had that happen. One example was one of the very few cases of a cheetah person attack and it was in one of the scenarios where the, the vehicle didn't have a door very very experienced guide who actually was picking people up from ah, it was an elephant that was not my stomach that much I can tell you um, he was picking people up from the airstrip and driving them back and to this day nobody really understands exactly why because the cheetah were very comfortable with vehicles which goes back to what I was saying about never becoming too comfortable in that kind of situation, but not that I'm saying it was his fault, but it, uh, the cheetah got up and walked past, and as it walked past, it went for him and grabbed his arm. Unfortunately, he was able to actually pull away from the cheetah because cheetah, that's a that's a best case scenario. You don't want that situation with a lion or a leopard, which are much stronger. Obviously, I've heard tales of the the few situations where leopards have jumped into a car. I've heard a story recently, actually, of a guy in the Mara who drove underneath a 
a tree that had a leopard in it, and I don't know exactly the circumstances, but apparently the leopard landed on his bonnet, growled furiously at him, and then took off, which I can imagine leaves one with a very fast heartbeat and a possible need for a change of clothes at that point. Now it has, it does happen, but it's very rare, and it's not something. I will tell you that David has gone to sleep and woken up with a lion head. How far was it from you, Dave? Honestly. Inches. Inches, says Dave. Inches away from him. She got curious and she came up to have a look. Um, we do sleep in shifts for that reason or else we close the covers. Just in case somebody gets just that little bit too curious. They're wild animals, it's night time and it becomes a very different ball game. So we sleep in shifts and we keep an eye on what's going on or else we close down completely with our rain covers. So we're basically in a little mobile tent. But again, it depends on what the animal's doing. And you can't really do that if they look like they're going to move again, because then you've got to be able to move with them. That's where the che following the cheat is nice, because when they go down, you know they're going down. Very useful though to have the infrared because what that means is that we can actually sit and watch them through the eyes of the camera um, and we don't have to have lights on at all so we watch them by using our cameras speaking of infrared it is of course an hour earlier in Juma but it has got dark let's go and look at a leopard in infrared with a kill It does look like something from another world, doesn't it? When you have all of these creatures with the infrared light, it's to me, it's, it's mesmerizing. Now she's gotten up and she's carried on feeding. And then, if you're wondering about that sharp light, that is the light from one of the, pardon me, from one of the vehicles in this area that are illuminating her. Because the quality of what we see to the naked eye is pretty much incomparable. I sort of make out her contour and her general shape but with the infrared light you can just see it a million times better so this is why we use it and why other guys without the infrared light well they've got to use the spotlight to be able to to see her better she seems to be quite hungry and she's got quite a big belly so i'm sure she's eaten quite a lot and every now and again we hear the crunching of the bones Now, she's not too far away from Chitra Dam, so if she wanted to go and have a drink there, I'm sure that would be the best spot. She's got the kill up here at the tree. So, a very good day for her. Proud cat mama, you're wondering how many teeth do leopards have? Well, I would guess that probably the same amount of lion, uh, the same amount as lion, so my guess is going to be 32. However, I'm not 100% sure, but if I had to guess, I would put it between 30 and 32. Hopefully that's correct, but I will double check once we get back and find out, and we'll let you know. Well, we had a similar question a while ago, and lions, definitely 32, so I would assume leopards are probably the same. Look at those whiskers. I love the way the whiskers look in the light. Now you see, that's what I was telling you earlier when you were wondering as how she manages to cut through the skin. That's exactly what she's doing there, putting her head on the side and then using her molars just to cut through the skin and be able to expose the, the skin, the muscles underneath, because that's actually really what she wants to try and eat. So she manages to get some of them with her front teeth. And now you see she's just using her paws to hold down the prey while she pulls and manages to get pieces of meat. Beautiful. <laughs> Looking very regal up there. And it's such a such a stunning view of her in this tree. We decided not to move. We decided that this was probably the best view for now. Um, just because here we can see her face. Whereas I'm a bit afraid that if we move around and we start bashing around the bushes then we're just going to see her body and not her face. But we'll definitely try a new angle just a little bit better. But we thought we'd give this one a try. Seeing she actually got up and she's a bit more active and she's feeding all around. <laughs> Beautiful girl. There were rumors of her mating with, oh, I think, Tingana a while ago, so I wonder if there's anything in that possibility, or if perhaps Tingana was just distracted in between her and Tandi. I could 
potentially be making this up, but I, th I think I remember something along those lines not too long ago. Okay, so Lou agrees. She was definitely mating with Tingana about a week ago. Okay, good. Good to know that I'm not going crazy and making up <laughs> parallel lives for the leopards around this area. So if everything goes well, hopefully she'll have her, I believe, first litter of cubs. So here's, here's to looking forward to her maybe potentially being pregnant and having tiny little ones later on. Lara, you're wondering if Kuchala could be a pregnant girl right now. Well, she's clearly done mating with Tingana, which means her Easter cycle is finished, so that is one of the possibilities. I would really much hope that she is, but I suppose we'll only find out in time, because it's very hard to tell from here, but if she's been mating, there's a very good chance that she is. Well, normally when they're quite this young, it takes them a little while before they actually conceive. Oh, that's beautiful. So hopefully, although with that big fat belly that she's got full of diker, <laughs> it almost seems like she's got, she's full of little cups. She looks very funny. She looks like a very strange ball with a head. <laughs> hmm, what a way to spend the afternoon. Our beard, you're wondering what her name means. Well, Kuchava is a word for Shangan that it's been roughly translated as scared, but it's, 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 it refers to somebody that's a bit shy slash scared. So th apparently when she was little, she was quite shy and uh, she wouldn't like to be seen from vehicles all that much. And from Tristan's experience, and Tristan's another one of the presenters at Safari Live, that he actually used to guide at Chitua many years ago. Um, that she was actually quite uh, a skittish little girl, or that's what what she was famous for. But it seems like she's grown into, into quite a relaxed one, and funny enough, even leopards that are a little bit scared of humans, and of course they are a lot more relaxed during the night, I think it's probably because they feel like they've got the dark cover on their side, probably feel a little bit better with that. But that's her beautiful Kuchala. And this is a brand new leopard for me too. I have never seen her before. So it's always wonderful to get to, new, to get to see new ones, but likely if I were to see her in the daylight, I wouldn't recognize. <laughs> I wouldn't recognize her. So here's to putting it out in the universe that I would like to see her during the daytime as well. There we go. The other vehicle has switched off their lights, and now we get a full infrared view of her. Richie, you're wondering why she left Tingana after mating with him. Well, leopards are not really sociable animals and a male and a female will only come together or start looking for one another just for mating purposes and while they mate, the females become um, really desperate. That's the word for a female leopard in heat. And um, they're constantly looking for the males and they want to mate and they're constantly offering themselves. But once her, her cycle is done, then they pretty much just leave and the male goes one side and then the female goes on to and she carries on with her life like they 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 are not sociable animals like for example lions do they want to live in prides or in leaps of leopards as the name would have it so the only times where you will see leopards or more than one leopard is the case of a mother and cubs and or a case of mate or a mating pair other than that it's very normal to see them just on their own I think her Easter cycle just came to an end and she, because it normally lasts only about four or five days and if she falls pregnant or if she is pregnant right now she'll have her cubs in about three months time and if she's not then likely in a few weeks time she's going to start looking for another partner, probably Tingana again as he seems to enjoy this area. Who knows, maybe she'll even attract quarantine. You can hear the crunching of the bones. Definitely feeding. <laughs> Trying to get through as much meat as she can. There we go, cutting through the skin again. That's when she tilts her head sideways, carries on. Well, it's, sometimes it's a bit hard to try and convey the sounds that, that we hear. And every now and again we hear the crunching of the bones. If we do again, I'll point it out once more. Hopefully we'll be able to hear it, but she's not. She's not. Um, 
she's not allowed <coughs> to her. So it's hard to hear. Now she keeps <coughs> gazing in that direction. So I wonder if perhaps if perhaps there's a hyena coming around somewhere. It's almost some sounded like something was walking in the grass, but I'm not too sure. So it's very hard to see now in the dark and I have no idea what she's looking at but whatever it is apparently it didn't bother her too much now there's another vehicle behind us so I, we might have to move um, yeah, seems like they're fine for now Maybe we'll, we'll try to move to give these guys a chance. So just bear with me for one second. We're gonna move. Let's see, maybe we can get a bit of a different angle. There's another vehicle behind us and they will not have access to her, but I think what we're gonna see now is gonna be epic. Ooh. All right. Seems like Jamie is still with her lovely lions and Kuchava is all the way up here on the tree. She doesn't seem to be going anywhere. So we're gonna stick around with her for a while longer, see what she gets up to. I'm sure she's gonna finish devouring this carcass. But while we do that, let's go over to Jamie and see what the lions do in the darkness. Hopefully they'll be getting up to a little bit of eating themselves. Well, we'll wait and see whether or not Kuchava jumps down from her tree, but we are still with our lovely lions, and our lovely lions are sort of showing signs of stirring. The lioness's head is up, the cubs don't really want to get up, but the lioness is up and looking about her. She's had a few yawns, a few paw licks, and maybe if we're really lucky, she might just roar for us before the end of the night. You never know. She's definitely keen on finding the rest of her group, I imagine. Hey girl, what do you suppose about that idea? You know, it's been interesting. And I mean, I'm sure there is a reason behind it. And, and I guess that some nights, it just, the, the chain reaction doesn't start. Some nights, the lions don't stop. They just roar all the way through the night. And some nights, they go absolutely dead quiet. And I promise you, they are quiet from the start of the night to the next morning. And I know that because we're awake listening to them a lot of the time. And you just, you don't hear them roaring anywhere. It, the whole night goes dead quiet and it seems to coincide with a complete silence from the hyenas as well. In fact, the whole night just, we just have some nights where there's just not a peep out of anything, except the hyraxes. They keep going, of course. And the crickets. And me occasionally to keep us awake. Poor Dave. But it's just something that I've noticed, an observation, and I guess if one guy is a little bit too full to roar and then his neighbors don't roar because he's not roaring and then nobody roars because nobody else is roaring, I guess that makes sense. It's <laughs> sometimes, if we, if we don't have anything, it, it does make finding them very difficult. Which is why we're always keen to try and find something before it gets dark, whether it's lion, leopard, cheetah, or serval, or whatever it happens to be. Because you guys don't always talk, do you? And then some nights, I remember once vividly saying to Dave, I really wish these lions would be quiet now. They roared. Do you remember that? We were on the other side of the river and they roared pretty much every 10 minutes. And they did it the entire night constantly and I mean I love the sound of lion roaring don't get me wrong I think maybe we were just overtired oh that was one of our first all-nighters Dave on that side sleepy cubs so guys we will 
be staying with the, hopefully, be staying with the Angama Pride the entire night. As I said, Scott is out. Brent has sort of vanished off the face of the planet, but he will be out as well tonight, hopefully with comms and signal. So do stay tuned. Do keep an eye on the Facebook pages because we will be going live if something exciting does happen. What that means, though, is that for tomorrow's Sunrise Safari, we will not be seeing you. During the first part of the Sunrise Safari, we will be doing one of our closed rehearsals Obviously, all in preparation and build up for our TV show in the next few days. So do stay tuned. Do keep an eye on the goings on. We apologize for not being with you tomorrow morning, but we will see you again tomorrow afternoon. And, oh, what is there? Oh, Yako. Nice, Dave. You see? That's why you should stay tuned. Because you never know what's going to come a trotting on past. Maybe a jackal, maybe something else. So as our jackal trots off into the darkness, for now Dave and myself will be saying farewell to you all and thank you and we'll send you back to Juma for the last few minutes of the Sunset Safari. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry guys, um, seems like we have managed to find a very good position to view her for a little while longer. And uh, what a stunning view this is. Are oh, you going to get up again and start moving? So, we can definitely tell that she's had a very good meal. I don't think she'll be complaining. And it's funny, like we were saying yesterday, we normally see the steampunk and the diker as tiny little creatures, probably not enough to feed them, but I think for smaller leopards, or maybe not, I shouldn't say smaller, but just for females rather than males, they still represent quite a good meal. I mean, Shadow and the cub were very happy with its steampunk, and judging by Kuchava's stomach size, I think this tiger has been quite a good one for her too. Oh, you're going to drop everything now. Do not drop it. We don't want you to drop it. Although, I'm not too sure how you're going to manage that. Luckily, you're still hyena area free. <laughs> so, even if she does drop it, or unless there's something lurking around that we haven't seen, she'll still be quite safe. But it seems like everything is just hanging there by just a little bit of the skin. And she's not holding on to it, so it does happen every so often that they drop their kills, especially when they're young and when they're still learning how to how to hoist their kills, put them up in trees and how to handle them when they're up there. A lot of the times they, the young ones lose them to, to hyenas and you can see the mother's faces like, oh no, you hear the crunching now. That's a bit too big for you, isn't it? Um, the roaring, it seems it was coming from Malamala side and it's still quite far from where we are and obviously the sound travels uh, far, far longer distances in, in cold air so hopefully the guys, those guys will carry on moving and they'll carry on moving onto the side that wherever it is that we can find them tomorrow and hopefully Kachava will also be here tomorrow I just want them all around. <laughs> I don't think anyone can blame me for that. Tony, you're wondering who do I believe would make the cutest little leopard cubs? Um, <laughs> I don't know. That's actually a very hard question because I just love everything that's tiny and it's got spots, so the smaller the cuter and my heart just goes all warm and fuzzy inside, so <laughs> I'm not too sure how to answer that. Mm, I'm not sure. Ah, oh, that's a good combination. <laughs> 
sorry guys, the girls in FC have quite the imagination. So according to Lou and Megan in FC, Tambo and Shungile would make very pretty cubs, but Rebecca all the way in the Mara disagrees because they're all still underage. <laughs> Mama Beck's always <laughs> looking after her children. But I agree with Megan and Lou, I reckon those could be very pretty. Maybe Tiani and Hosanna could make really pretty cubs too. Because Tiani's got that something to her and hmm, I think that would be an interesting combination too. I like I like that one. And then who knows? I think yeah. I just like them all. That's the problem. When they're tiny and fluffy they're just so pretty. But yeah, I would say Hosanna and Tiani, Tamba and Shungile eventually. So that Rebecca doesn't get all <laughs> alarmed. <laughs> and then, hmm, I, would, I don't know, I reckon a combination of Shadow or Tundi with Mr. Anderson could produce some very interesting looking offspring. Well guys, it's starting to become that time of the day again where we start saying our goodbyes and bid everyone farewell and thanking you all for accompanying us on this beautiful safari. I think we've been extremely lucky today. It's been for sure a day to remember that is Senzo trying to turn everything up so that he doesn't blind me. <laughs> now maybe I feel like the Impala do <laughs> when we shine the lights at them by mistake. So I'm pretty sure we'll see everyone tomorrow and tomorrow the first hour and a half is Juma and Mara will be joining us tomorrow morning a little bit later on and I believe if I'm not mistaken that Tristan is going to be taking you on the morning safari. But we'll, we'll see about it tomorrow. But let's spend our very last minutes just looking at that beautiful Kuchava and just enjoying the very, the, very, the very blessing that it is to spend some time with a very relaxed leopard while it feeds on its kill. I'm gonna have one last look at her. And I don't think we could have, I could have asked for a better introduction to this beautiful leopard. Definitely a good dinner. Goodbye everyone. We'll see you all tomorrow and thank you for joining.